Good evening, everybody. everybody. Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to the second day of the lecture series organized by IQAC and the Department of English, Borabazar Bikram Tudu Memorial College. It has been a very memorable first day, and we hope to be enriched further in this second day academic discourse. We have today as our first uh, speaker, uh, Deborah Nangolo, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer with the Chair of English, Postcolonial and Media Studies at the University of Münster, Germany. She read for her BA at the University of Malawi and both her MA and PhD at Münster University. She co-edited the volume Locating African European Studies, Interventions, Intersections, Conversations, published by Rutledge in 2020, and her work has also appeared in the peer-reviewed journal, Research in African Literatures. Deborah was a 2019 fellow at the Institute for Critical Social Enquiry at the New School in New York, and she has given talks at various international academic conferences. For her next book-length project, she's examining how hashtag activism is shifting the contours of knowledge production. Today, she will be speaking on the topic, hashtag movements and decolonial pedagogy. Uh, Deborah, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And hello. Yes. For everyone uh, who's joined us today, or part of the world you're joining from, but maybe it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening in India right there. It's good evening, but here in Germany right now, it's good afternoon. So may, if I keep on saying good afternoon, just it's because here it's afternoon. So um, thank you very much for the, to the organizers for inviting me. This is a very great, I take this as a very great honor. And yeah. As you've heard from the introduction, today I'll be talking about hashtag movements and decolonial pedagogy. And uh, before I go into my talk proper, I would just like to give you a little bit of structure of my, I'll just uh, start sh sharing my screen as well, and I'll uh, sort of uh, Switch off my camera so that you can you can have the you can have the screen. Okay. All right. Okay. I hope you can see. That's uh, first of all, I'll talk about hashtag activism itself. What is it? And then the second part of my talk, I'll talk about hashtag movements as part of the colonial pedagogy. Deborah, that you is, have to I'll open the slide. Yeah. You haven't uh, you haven't opened the slide. You have to open the slide. Okay, so you can't see it? Mm, yes, yes, no. You have to click on it, no? Talk about that, that, that the last slide. You haven't opened okay. it. Okay, so you, you, can, you, can, you can, what can you see? Um, I can see that folder. Oh, last you can just see the folder, okay. Oh, yeah. All right, let me... Mm, you just have to click on that last file. Okay. We don't call it now. Me. Can you see it? No, okay. Okay, let me just do that. Okay, so we just 
Um, okay. So let's um, start sharing again, and I hope you'll be able to see it now. Okay. All right, can you see it now? Yeah? Yes, we are able to see. Yeah, okay. I'll just make it full screen. If you don't, yeah. if you want to see it, please let me know. So I'll just do that. Okay. Yeah, no. yeah you, can, you can see the second slide. What is hashtag activism? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, all right. So then we just go on. Okay, so yes, yeah, so my talk... ...in two parts. So in the, in the second part, I'll talk about hashtag movements, or that is movements which leverage hashtags for their activism and how they can be used as part of decolonial pedagogy in the classroom. And I'll be doing this by using uh, two examples from my seminar concept. And that is um, uh, seminars I taught in the winter semester of 2018, 2019, and which I'm again teaching this summer semester of 2020. Okay. So, uh, you probably know, you've heard about hashtags. Uh, I think they're now very ubiquitous. Uh, they are talked about everywhere during different social media platforms, or they can also be part of a photo shoot, for instance, by the former first lady there, whereby she was supporting the cause of Bring Back Our Girls. So uh, hashtags are ubiquitous now, and they are found in so many different places. So, uh, but what is it, uh, what is it so, so special about hashtags? And in 2012, we see that hashtags was voted as the word of the year by the American Dialectic Society. And you might be asking, why, would people feel the need to write a hashtag instead of just writing something to answer this question as I go through my presentation? So let's start with the etymology of the word hashtag itself. So simply hashtag, it's made up, it's a blend of two words. as in the symbol, as in tagging or labeling. So, um, this word came about as uh, part of the move to organize information in order to, you know, find it better, to search it better. And different Critics have defined words. If you look at that definition from Saxton, it, it simply says short words or phrases that follow the hash or pound sign. And if you go and look at the Twitter grocery, you find the following definition of hashtag. That is, it typically consists of a string of characters, possibly including numerical digits, preceded by the pound symbol, also called hash, and it's clickable, and when you click on it, it brings you to a page that displays all public tweets that include the same string of characters. And while hashtags were originally innovated for purposes of information organization and management, and while they have now also been embraced by the infrastructure of most social media platforms, they are well suited to the communication affordances of the Twitter platform. So, as you can see on the slide, this was the first ever tweet by a Twitter, someone who suggested, you know, using hashtags to organize information on Twitter. And according to social linguist uh, Alison Sharp, Messina wanted to improve contextualization content filter 
Green and sociability with hashtags gain traction on Twitter during the San Diego bushfires. And we can see that today they have become almost commonplace and they've been embraced by different platforms. But I'm tagging, and this is my interest as someone who works in the English department, who works with language, who works with stories, with narratives, is that they also offer commentary. And forms. So we can see in this example. As you can see in that example, here's an example of a tweet. It just reads, not another video conference, totally zoomed out. So if you look at that tweet, you can see that it's self-reflexive. That is the last string of characters, the, tweet, um, the hashtag uh, string of characters is making commentary on the content of its own tweet. So it's making content on the string totally zoomed out. It's making commentary on the content, not another video conference. So just expressing a certain sentiment towards the idea of video conferencing. So this can be just one way that you can look at the form of tweets of how they function. But beyond this self-reflexive action, uh, tweets also offer wider social commentary on topical issues, events, second example. So this is an example that is taken from a tweet by the American actress, Alisa Milano. And this was a tweet from 2017. Uh, she is credited for popularizing the phrase Me Too. And so she tweeted that if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply to these tweets. And of course, uh, this expression, this phrase, Me Too, had already been there. It had already been coined by another woman, an African American woman who, who was using it for her grassroots victims of sexual harassment. And of course, that was before it went on Twitter and Alisa Milano brought it to the wider public. And um, after she did that, uh, we can see that the hashtag uh, gained popularity and a lot of people started to use the hashtag. With that, uh, different uh, publics started developing and narratives started developing around the hashtag. And as uh, Bruns and Burgess say, the power of using hashtags in advocacy lies in that it allows movements to spread organically to like-minded individuals and organizations and to spread value to other users of the social media platform. It is participatory and therefore powerful. It constitutes a decentralized user-generated tagging, organizing and classifying system. In other words, it can lead to the formation of ad hoc public networks that can develop around the hashtag. And uh, for someone like me who studies narratives, this is very important because once it does that, you can see that a lot of stories, a lot of narratives start developing around the hashtag and it becomes important to connect these stories, to see what it is that they're Because there, there are narratives that are taking place, this enables, these are the characteristics of hashtags that enables the emergence of hashtag activism. And hashtag activism as an expression itself, first used the phrase in an article for The Guardian during the Occupy Wall Street movements. So he's the one who came up with this phrase, hashtag activism. And today, of course, it's, it's widely used and it's become part of research. A lot of researchers who are researching on new media or on social movements use it. Uh, to explore various issues. And um, I like this definition from Yang because of the way he defines hashtag activism 
and the way he also tries to bring in the issue of narratives, the issue of stories. And he simply describes it as a discursive protest on social media or sentence. So an example of something like this would be, I think this is something that is very topical at the moment. A lot of people are talking about it, Black Lives Matter. And as he goes on to say, an incidence of hashtags and retweets appear on social media in response to a hashtag word, phrase, or sentence. Because these comments and retweets consist of numerous personal stories and appear in temporal order, they assume they assume a narrative form. Narrative agency is the central to hashtag activism. So you can see how you know hashtags can be looked at as a form of narratives. So because if you can trace, it's not always easy, but if you can trace the origins of a hashtag, you can see okay, it has a beginning. And probably you can see how it is developing. Maybe it will have a climax at some point, or maybe at some times there's a falling action. And sometimes you can also trace its conclusion, how something ends. Maybe if, for instance, something actually changes in offline spaces, or maybe there's a policy intervention that takes place in conjunction with that hashtag. So indeed, it is possible for people like me who study, who've studied narratives, who studied in to look at these things and and to think of hashtags as narratives is important because it helps us to bring in questions of power and this is very important because hashtags usually are part of movements and movements are always questioning most of the times not always but most of the times they are questioning power Just that are there in the world, you know, just national power hierarchies. And it is important when you look, when you're studying hashtags, because you can explore these things and you can see whose stories get to be narrated and which stories achieve. It showed you that Me Too a tweet from Alisa Milano, it became popular after Alisa Milano, of course, she's a celebrity and actress. She brought it on onto Twitter and it became viral. But um, Tarana Burke had been, you know, had had a grassroots organization, had been doing the work before, and probably not a lot of people knew about it before before it went onto Twitter. And you can also quest, uh, ask questions of who benefits, whose stories are erased, which narratives are silenced, which ones are co-opted. which groups come to be empowered and of course also more importantly social media you know even hashtag activism does not work on its own it also still needs traditional media for instance for a hashtag to become viral if it's picked up by mainstream media or by the traditional media the likelihood of a hashtag becomes viral is also higher as opposed to when it's not picked up by the media so it's also important when we are doing our studies to look at okay, which hashtags do the media pick up and which ones do they not? All right. So um, just moving on from that list of questions that I talked about, about the power structures, at this point, I'll just you know, get into a discussion, briefly show you my, my course syllabus. So the course, this course, I have been teaching it and I came up with the concept because, you know, I wanted to integrate in my studies the idea of decolonial pedagogy. And uh, what I wanted to do was create a space whereby students are also are able to work in teams, are able to work independently, but of course with my guidance, but then They are as you heard from the introduction, I teach I teach in, in, in Germany. Um, and in Germany, of course, we have a certain demographic, uh, a concentration of a certain demographic in class. 
and also the topics that are covered in the curriculum. And it was my way of thinking, how do I bring in studies of different places into the classroom? How do I get students to know about different places, but also to know about different topics? But in this way, I also wanted them to be very actively involved in that process. And I also wanted them, social media has the tendency to make things look novel as if they're happening for the first time. But I wanted them to have this historical approach whereby things are historicized. So the idea of the, of the courses is that they get a lot of new texts. And uh, for each of the hashtags that uh, we, um, we analyze in class, I usually give them a keyword. So there's one, let me give an example of the one that says Nafri, Sylvester 2016. Maybe m m most of you might not be familiar with this hashtag, but it is one which started in Germany, um, the Sylvester 2016, that was the New Year's racial profile. The NAFRI is uh, sort of stands for North African men. So they are racial profiling North African men after it was alleged that um, these North African men were sexually harassing women during these New Year celebrations. So they were using those. So in each of these, I tell them, okay, you have your keyword racial profiling. So they have to understand what is racial profiling. They have to understand the history of it and then try to connect it to the particular hashtag. So this is just one example of uh, something uh, that we do in class. So as you can see from the topics we've done, uh, we've been Uh, to Paris, to India, uh, because also this course worked in a way because at, I, I had international students as well at this time. And I had a student from India who uh, really did a good presentation on how to India with some celebrities, but in the end, she came up to the conclusion that, you know, it was still an elitist movement because a lot of people were of a certain class and not everybody has access to social media. And also the issue of language itself, uh, most of the tweets like where, you know, people were tweeting in English and she gave the statistics that no one, not everybody speaks English, although a good one, English, that is just a, an example, one example. And uh, we also have like decolonization and roads must fall. I think um, if you are not aware of this one, this was in South Africa. It is, I think, part of the decolonization of activists are demanding the decolonization of university spaces, for instance, by not only decolonizing the curriculum, this, which is something that it, this syllabus does, but also maybe, you know, removing statues of from students have to understand what is decolonization and of course they have to historicize, to historicize it put it in its historical context because they must know that roads must fall the hashtag might be something that has started is new it's good it mobilizes people but there is a whole discourse behind it that predate that goes back from way back so looked at um, in the in a semester before and in the current semester uh, the concept is still similar and but this time the idea also focuses mainly on knowledge of sphere and uh, for the students I like the class to be as participatory as it can be and the students um, before the semester starts, I ask them that they can suggest hashtags 
which they would want to study in class. So you have to find out how did the particular hashtag start, trace it, and then if if it went viral, how did it go viral? How is it spreading? And what was its lifespan? Is is there any hope for it? Or maybe it's just we also look at ideas like slacktivism, whereby you know there might be this idea that a hashtag. Activism is something that, you know this type of activism is a sort of lazy activism whereby people just sit down on their chairs or on their couch and then they think they're doing something or they're doing something about climate change by clicking on their laptop sending an email but when actually that does nothing to change the situation on the ground yeah so yeah, to go back to the concept, students are asked to contribute ideas of which hashtags they want to look at. And um, we, oh yeah, maybe this is a, a good example. Oh, this was also a student to hashtags which came from, from India. And we looked at them as, is it activism or selectivism? Because here we're, you know, like the girls who drink beer, it was uh, women sharing pictures of themselves uh, when they went out. So we discussed, okay, does this help to, ch to change attitudes or does it really help the problem? And then we compared with, uh, for instance, with statistics um, of uh, gender-based violence, for instance, in India. So yeah, we've... that. Um, look at that because yeah the class is still going to come that's just part of the syllabus and of course we also look at the climate strikes and um i think in a nutshell that's that i have a discussion about it and i can give you more examples and respond to your questions and i'll stop sharing the screen now and just um switch on my video okay, okay. all right okay yeah so, so there are a few questions sir. it was wonderful presentation devora and yeah. um, it was a wonderful presentation, Devora, and um, um, for the participants, uh, let me tell you that uh, this hashtag movement that is talking about, um, sometimes it can be super annoying, but in today's age, it can be served as one of the most powerful tool for raising awareness, starting digital movements, and spreading protests, and propelling some kind of social change. And if you were telling about, uh, about India, then I can... I can immediately uh, remember four or five uh, hashtag movements like talk to a Muslim where the actress Gohar Khan talked about the historian Rana Sabhi. These are some kind of Indian issues. They were telling from that perspective and uh, for our audience, let me tell you that, um, that uh, there is another one uh, that like girls who drink beer, that is women against sexism, then talk to a Muslim Indian Muslim against uh, Islamophobia, and then not in my name. That is, in, uh, that's Indian citizens uh, against lynching of Muslims and Dalit activists, and then save you. That's the student and and the teachers. They went against um, uh, some kind of gundagarde in the campus in back in February 2017, I guess. And last of all, um, uh, let me ask you a question, Devoda. That now. We are all going through that hashtag movement, it, uh, Black Lives Matter. And this one yeah. that is originated on Facebook and through a, uh, I guess, a heartfelt post after the shooting of 17 year old, um, some um, Trevor Martin, or I guess that name in 2012. And that hashtag led to a uh, civil, uh, civil right movement in the USA and was used 30 million times. Uh, in Twitter and in other social networking sites uh, as an average 17 or 18,000 um, times it is repeated per, uh, posted in the uh, site. So the movement campaigns against violence towards the black people. 
So what is your take on this? On the what Black Lives Matter man? Yes. What yeah. is your take on this Black Lives Matter? And particularly uh, in the context of yeah, the so you just want yes. to... Yeah. What is your take on yeah. it? Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, this is, of course, this is a... Um, the, the hashtag itself and the movement itself, this is a very important movement as we can see that uh, issues of, yeah, of racial violence, police brutality really ha have, have not ended, have not come to an end. We still struggle with in a post-racial world, or maybe racism is an issue of the past and people shouldn't worry about it. But in a way, it is still a very big problem. And uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement helped bring a lot of, yeah, you can say uh, the, the labor that is there online, but there's also a lot of work going on offline. And um, this, right now, the hashtag maybe itself has become. Yes, it's a kind, it's a so kind of movement and popular. Will not... Let me mm -hmm. ask you uh, under two questions that that I have picked up among a uh, lot of questions. Um, uh, first question mm -hmm. is from Srijata Roy. Uh, she's telling that this with reference to the current lecture on hashtag movements, I wanted to ask how do we determine the sample size of post for such studies? How do we determine the sample size of post for such study? Yeah, or oh, determining the sample size. Of course, um, yeah, uh, this it, it also depends on, on the question that you, you want to answer. So maybe, for instance, if you would want to say, okay, at which time was the Black Lives Matter hashtag mostly used, then probably you would look at the time maybe when there was, you would try maybe to look at the time when maybe there was news around maybe uh, Trayvon Martin or maybe news around uh, George Floyd and try maybe to look and then that would be your way of determining the sample size. But it, it really depends on the question that, that you want to answer. So you can actually say, okay, I'll look at everything from the period because this issue was really happening. For example, in, I'll just say, for example, it's up. There is another question. June. So you try to start in June, yeah. This is from Navin Kelvin Talmeida, who is a postgraduate student of English Literature, St. Alumnus College, Bangalore. Uh, he's telling mm -hmm. that speaking of social media activism, what role do you think memes play in physical turnout? And, if, um, and uh, he's also telling about some kind of social activism that where memes could indeed have a role to play in mobilizing action. So how can memes be one of the tools for for initiating this kind of uh, social activism, um, activism and uh, sociocultural mm -hmm. activities, what does um, okay. memes play role? Okay, sorry, you were breaking up. It, I, I didn't catch the whole of your question. Did you ask what role memes play in? Yes, memes play uh, yeah. in initiating yeah. this kind of. Yeah, um, my, my research, I do not mainly look at memes, but I know that, yeah, memes. It's actually have in initiating a social movement, but usually they, they tend to be humorous or ironical, but they also have this potential to make things go viral. So in a way, Hmm. In a way, memes can when, play, when uh, I do like a discourse analysis of, for instance, if a hashtag contains an image, what does that image say? So you see that if you, when you look at different hashtags, you see that different hashtags also tend to be, when someone uses a hashtag, they'll probably maybe 
attach a photo or they will attach a meme to it. So you can see that there is a way that these two also work together in sort of to try to spread the message. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, mm -hmm. There is another question that uh, the relevance of BLM encounter to which we saw all lives matter. Uh, what is your take on the counter culture movement? It means while people are uh, going with uh, Black Lives Matter, there is, there is yeah. another canon that is telling that all lives matter. So what is your take mm -hmm. on this counter culture movement and its pedagogy? Okay, yes. Um, when it comes to the question of all lives matter, yes, this is a question that has been discussed also a lot in the research as well. And I, I do have my own views about it. I think uh, Black Lives Matter as a movement itself, it's a movement that is identifies a specific problem. Okay, there's a problem, the problem is racism. So currently we are dealing with a problem of racism. What All Lives Matter does is sort of, it undermines the message of Black Lives Matter because it sort of speaks of this universal as we all are into humanity in the same way as if we all matter in the same way when that is not the case when there are actually groups that have not reached at that level so my view on all lives matter is at the moment there is a problem and the problem is racism and that's something that needs to be dealt with and uh, all lives matter is something that should wait because it takes away from from the cause of black lives matter there is another question yeah. that is um, how far do you think hashtags become a tool for the parties in power to divert mm -hmm. public opinion and public attention from matters that need it to the matters that they would benefit from and as we often see in in many countries across the globe because there is always a counter hashtag circulating with the hashtag supported by activists very tricky question and a big, very good. Sorry, can you repeat the question? You are breaking up. Yes. How far do you think hashtags become a tool for the parties in power to divert public attention from matters that need it and to the matters that they would benefit from as the offense in countries across the globe because there is always a counter hashtag circulating with the hashtag supported by activists. It means at the same time, there is another group who is trying to defend those who are doing this hashtag movement. So there is another hashtag movement that is, that is parallelly going on at the same time. And while doing all this, our government is uh, compelling us to move our attention from those points where we should give our attention the best. So what is your take on it? Yes, yeah, that, that is very true that every time there's like a hashtag, usually another counter hashtag develops. Maybe it can be by those in power who try to be another group co-opting the other the hashtag of another group. So there's always this problem that there's always this challenge that is there. But if, even if you look at traditional movements, you see that the problem of a counter movement developing is usually there and in like in physical protest that happen offline maybe we see maybe an activist group they have a protest and then another group maybe that supports like the party in power or the government they also organize their own protest on the same day so the problem of Counter protests is is always there, and usually there is a protest and a counter protest happening at the same time. Uh, so, in a way, I would say when it comes to when it happens on online spaces, the violence is still there, but maybe at least ideas of physical violence are in a way a bit mitigated although not completely erased, but a bit mitigated, I would say that. And, uh, but it's a challenge that is always there with, 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 with protests. Okay. That's it. Okay. 
Um, someone is telling that um, you have mentioned that uh, Me Too movement uh, was an elitist movement. So while you were telling it as an elitist movement, do you think that takes away it from its efficacy? Devora, am I audible to you? Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat your question? I didn't catch it. I just said Me okay. Too, and then you. Me I lost too, you. Uh, Me Too was an elitist movement. So, do uh -huh. you think that takes away uh, from its efficacy while you are um, considering it as an elitist movement? So, do you think that uh, this kind of elitism takes away right. the uh, the efficacy from the movement? Okay. Uh, does it take away the efficacy from the movement? Um, not. I. I. Wouldn't say it takes away the efficacy from the movement. Managed to to achieve a lot in terms of just bringing awareness to issues of sexual violence and especially maybe in the way like if you look at the Hollywood con context and just the idea of making powerful men who conduct such actions to be accountable. It did help. But to begin with, it was not, you know, if it was not uh, representative of a wider group of women, women with with different needs. So the, quest, uh, the example of elitism came uh, actually From my student who was doing research in India, in of India, it was mainly uh, middle-class women, highly educated, English-speaking, or with a college degree, who took part in this Me Too movement. But uh, there are still a lot of women, for instance, maybe uh, who are victims of a rape culture, uh, who are not reached by this movement. So, or maybe who cannot participate because of maybe access to just for well, one to take part in in a movement online you need to have access to the right yes got to so, uh, and the digital device was where the idea of them coming was coming in mm -hmm. okay okay so now uh, regarding the second part of your lecture that about the decolonial pedagogy um, yeah it is not a question but rather my observation well, I'll, I'll, let me tell you something about the Indian context. <laughs> Although we are living in the post-colonial mm -hmm. uh, time period, but are we post-colonial in nature? I think that decolonial practices um, aim to reveal and dismantle um, the power relationship in knowledge and in practice, uh, and more especially in almost every institutional practices. And the self is to, to enable some kind of alternate ways of understanding and at the same time of being and uh, I, I think intellectually means huh? uh, can you just repeat like uh, go back 10 seconds uh -huh. what i'm telling that decolonial practices um, in particularly in indian context aim to reveal and uh, dismantle the power relationship in all the institutional practices am i audible to you yeah, to go on your practices as institutional practices. Yes, and to reveal and dismantle the power relation. And uh, in Indian context, uh, this uh, particularly in mm -hmm. Indian uh, rural areas, mm -hmm. this practice is based, best characterized uh, by, uh, it, um, it is called something trichophenic. Uh, while it seeks ultimate validation from the master, it, it also seeks to define itself in exception. And in every case, uh, we have we have become Eurocentric and in sense of self worth or in sense of confidence, rest on the approval form to the master source, and that master source belongs to some way, waste. So it produces what uh, I can say at last um, once called it is a kind of captive mind here, yeah. and we are paralyzed by the Western thought, and uh, and we are unaware of our own captivity. We are captive means we are not living in the post colonial era we are living in the uh, still in the colonial uh -huh. yeah, in this colonial era and 
uh, discussion i want to tell you that um, i want to engage you in this kind of disruptive pedag pedagogical discussion what do you still think that um, like indians or like the other people who are once colonized they are still captive and uh, they are unaware of their unaware of their own captivity what is your take on it? are we still okay. captive uh, okay you're saying we uh, yeah if i understood your question you're saying okay we are not in a post colonial era uh the era is still sort of colonial and you are saying that you are giving an example of like uh in india that people are still captive in to some extent because we are trying to justify some things while we are comparing it to the west so mm -hmm. to some extent we are unaware of this kind of captivity we have to mm -hmm. engage ourselves in kind of uh decolonial pedagogical movements where we have to make comparison with the regional literature or with the text that, that is produced with within the territory not by making a simple comparison with the west but uh, we always try to judge something with uh, comparing it to some superior pieces and we always consider that the west can be a superior place to some extent and here uh, it seems like that we are all trying to judge everything uh, to that matthew arnold's touchstone method where he also gives some kind of me methods that uh, this poetry is good this poetry is bad so i'm telling that do also believe that to some extent all the countries or all the all the regions those who are colonized um, past they are still in a some kind of captive captivity is there in their mind also are they totally free from all kind of uh -huh. colonial passes ah please tell yeah okay all right okay uh, of course in some parts you are breaking up but i think i i, I understood the question that yes when it comes to the issue of, of decolonization maybe where exactly are the previously colonized countries or the in post-colonial or are people still colonized still held captive by the colonial structures yes and i and i think this is true at different levels we can still that the we can still see that the colonial power structures still function in the world today on the economic level as well so in a way i think that is why the movement of decolonization is very important and when i was giving my presentation i emphasized the notion of history sizing because i think it's something that has to be that has to be ongoing and it's something we've been is we've come a long way we've had like the independence whereby the independence of just countries becoming independent becoming their own states but we still have a lot more decolonization to do in terms maybe of linguistic or in terms yeah. of knowledge itself That is it. Yes, we are making that they still, we are still missing. We need to bring in more indigenous knowledges to, to start to value them more. That I will agree with you. But I think it, a decolonization is a process. And we can see, I think, with the current waves of decolonization that is happening now, if we. compare with, for instance, in the African countries where countries wanted independence and the decolonization of today where maybe students are going to the streets and demanding decolonization. We can see that there is a shift, a shift also in mindset itself. And I think more needs to be done. And I think people just need to be vigilant and, and work towards it. But, um, I think it's something uh, that is happening and I'm um, hopeful that, yeah. Okay. okay, okay. If the process continues, things will change. Okay. 
तो I guess we have do we have any All, question no we don't have any more question and uh, I think this kind of decolonial practices uh, more spe- specifically in pedagogy in the teaching of English literature at the undergraduate level of post colonial India is very much needed and this wonderful lecture and thank you for taking the time to speak on hashtag movements and uh, decolonial pedagogy and I felt that your remarks are especially uh, timely and we truly appreciate um, scholars and activists like you who are willing to give their time and talents to enrich the lives of us, the young people. So there were many thanks for addressing our listeners, students, peers and colleagues on these issues. You are doing a wonderful service. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Hope to meet you soon. Stay safe and sound. Hope to meet you soon. Okay, you too. Yeah, yeah all right. Okay, then. I've enjoyed the rest of the series. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, that was a very illuminating and thought-provoking uh, lecture uh, on the hashtag activism. Uh, that is uh, critiqued as uh, being elitist and uh, being uh, lazy, but which uh, and guided by power struggles, but uh, which also has immense possibility to bring change. So that was a very interesting lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, as our second speaker today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Roshni Shengupta, uh, who is an assistant professor in this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, as a second speaker today or uh, in this evening, we have uh, Dr. Roshni Shengupta, who is an assistant professor in the Institute of Middle and Far East, Jagadonian University in Krakow, Poland. She has earlier been assistant professor at the Deedon Institute of Area Studies, Deedon University, Netherlands, and fellow at the International Institute for Asian Studies, Deedon. Her research interests lie in areas of South Asian politics and culture and post-colonial studies. Her monograph, Reading the Muslim on Celluloid, Bollywood, Representation and Politics, has recently been published by Primus India. She is currently finalizing a two-part edited anthology on media and literature in post-partition South Asia, uh, which is to be published by Rutledge. She has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, edited volumes, and is also prolific on popular news and opinion portals. Today, uh, Dr. Shen Gupto will be speaking on the topic Transnational Indian Diasporas, the Forgotten History of the Twice Migrants. Over to you. We are not able to hear you, ma'am. Oh, uh, my, yes. okay. Yes, can yes, you yes, hear yes. me now? Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. yes. You uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this um, very enlightening, um, as I'm sure it's very enlightening, a uh, series of lectures. And I was listening in to Dr. Um, uh, Deborah Nyangulu's lecture a little while ago. And I really uh, felt it is, uh, I, I benefited a lot from being online and listening to her. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. Um, so my topic today is, and let me just share my screen with you because I have a PPT to show. Um, okay. Yes, it is there. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to put my uh, put my uh, video off for the moment. Yes. Yes. All right. So basically, um, as you see on your screen, the topic of my lecture today is transnational Indian diasporas, the forgotten story of the twice migrants. Um, and as you can notice, I have put the words forgotten and the phrase twice migrants in quotes. And that's exactly why they are in quotes, because it is the story of the forgotten people or the forgotten members of the Indian diaspora, the indentured labor diaspora that was taken away in the late 17th and 18th centuries to the sugar plantations of the Caribbean and other parts of the world by the British colonizers. 
and uh, were pretty much sort of assimilated in those societies. Uh, some of them became then twice migrants. And the reason I call them twice migrants is because they migrated first from their homeland in India to the Caribbean, and then from the Caribbean to uh, Europe, primarily to Netherlands. So my story today would uh, basically is based on the Surinamese Hindustani community that is uh, a part of the Dutch cultural landscape. Um, my research on the Surinamese Hindustani community is primarily from the point of view of the political and cultural connections that they have with the homeland. So I look at several aspects of long distance nationalism, cultural, um, you know, cult and cultural connections in terms of Bollywood and so on and so forth. Um, but my lecture, my, my focus today is going to be just to give you an overview of what this community um, has been able to achieve in terms of its cultural space um, in the Netherlands. And I will tell you that uh, through uh, the story about the community of the Hindustanis uh, getting their own temple space in the southeastern part of Amsterdam. But before I get to that, um, I will just give you an overview of, of what, the, what this particular group that I'm going to be talking about, uh, where they came from. So it is the Indian labor diaspora that we're talking about. And as I said, they are the indentured laborers who were taken away by the British colonizers in the 17th and 18th century. Um, the historian Bridge Lal has called it a new form of slavery. Um, and although indentured laborers were taken from other parts of the world as well, but most of them came from India. The British called them coolies or menial workers. And these coolies were then transported to colonial sugar plantations in the Caribbean, southern uh, United States, and also to Latin America. So what did they do when they got to um, the uh, these areas that they had never visited, they did not know at all? These were village folk, primarily from the agricultural community. And they were agricultural laborers, laborers, right? So these are illiterate village folk who land up on completely foreign shores. And what do they do there? How do they constitute themselves as a community or a diaspora? So we have, um, theoretically, uh, we observe three distinctive features of this Hindu labor diaspora, as it has also been called. And the first feature that I wanted to discuss is how they reconstitute their family life. So having been uprooted from their village, um, they have to completely reset their lives in a new location. And how do they do that? Of, of course, the men reassert their control and, lead, and then lead to the reconstruction of the typical Indian patriarchal family system. But this family system also provides the community with a source of social cohesion. And then uh, all these families together form a communal group and then they start reasserting communal life within the harsh climes of the plantation. The second point is religious conviction. Uh, of course, about 83% of the uh, indentured laborers that were shipped off to various parts of the world uh, were Hindu, and therefore Hinduism is seen as the dominant religion of this particular diaspora. Um, a very small number of Brahmins were also on those ships. Um, but since they were Brahmins, they were at the forefront to impose the ritualistic beliefs on community formation when they formed, started forming these new communities. Orthodox forms of Hinduism therefore became predominant. However, they maintained a connection to what they called the great tradition of India. And this was primarily a religious spiritual con connection. And this, but this kind of religious and spiritual sustenance is even to this day drawn from India by this community. And it sort of spills over into the cultural ties that the community also has, uh, vital attachments that the community also has with India. <clears throat> the third aspect of their community formation was the adoption of Ramayan as a sacred text or as an essential text of the Hindu diaspora. Um, and why did the Ramayan become an essential text? 
because you know the central theme of this epic is exile is suffering struggle and the myth of eventual return of course in the ramayan rama returns but for a num for the majority of these uh, hindus uh, or the hindustanis as they are now known they never returned to their homeland you know so i call it the myth of eventual return but there is also this idea of exile in the in the um, in the epic which appealed to them which resonated with them and of course of suffering and struggle also the text is is quite simple and of course like i told you these were illiterate agricultural laborers illiterate folks village folk so the simple text where there is a clear distinction between good and evil um proved very useful to them in this harsh world of the plantation and also the ramayan provided a moral code which was of course um, imposed by the brahmins um and they also saw uh, and they still see actually the ramayan as an epic that is largely casteless um which may not be true which we may debate among ourselves but the community largely sees ramayan as this epic which where even the marginalized communities are given positions of power so the focus is on physical prowess or economic resourcefulness and not just uh, your birth or your caste status so these are the reasons why the ramayan began to be adopted as a um, as a moral code for the community uh just to give you some numbers this is essentially how the indentured laborers were um shipped off to different parts of the world so you see that um a, a large number went to trinidad a very very large number went to british guyana a smallish number went to suriname which is 34000 well uh, you know in terms of the size Deep, of suriname uh, sorry for interrupting you can you please make it full screen can you please make it full screen one second i'll make it uh -huh. full screen uh -huh. is it okay yes 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 perfectly okay. ah okay thank um, i'm sorry it was maybe the people couldn't see it properly um so i was yeah so basically you also can see that a number of indians were taken to natal in south africa and to the reunio islands mauritius malaya and fiji this is of course a map of the colonial possessions um at the time 1900s so this is basically the time period we're talking about so in trinidad and tobago uh, this is an image an old image from uh, the tropen museum in amsterdam uh, where um, you have a a group of uh, you know uh, indentured laborers newly arrived um, just off the ship this is also a large family of indentured laborers in south africa although in south africa you also find um a, a quite a large proportion of people from south india so from south of south indian origin who also went as indentured laborers but um on on an average most people came from up and bihar so these are uh, what is no what were known as the coolies in the midst of some kind of a celebration you can also spot some people with skull cap so you know that it was more like a communal celebration of all the hindustanis together in irrespective of whether they are hindu or muslims so you have some a couple of muslims also participating in this particular uh, festival over here fiji fiji is um, also an interesting case study a similar kind of pictures everywhere because you know these people were just taken on ships um with you know just very very bare minimum necessities with them and here you can in this picture you see some kind of a sport going on maybe wrestling i am not sure it's it's quite unclear actually so this map shows you um the the trans the, the way people moved the out migration um and the and and the fact that people moved from one place to, um, from one colonial uh, location to another at a later date right so the you know my focus is going to be is is the twice migrant community and there are two kinds of twice twice migrant community one is the indentured labor diaspora that i just spoke about and the second twice migrant community is the uh, east african gujaratis who um 
were were basically a business a, a business community that wanted to make a better life for themselves and saw some business prospects in east african countries and they moved from gujarat and parts of bombay uh, bombay presidency into east Afri into, into uh, countries in east africa and they formed a very sig a significant diaspora over there of gujarati speakers um, at some point of decolonization of africa um, the regimes that came up uh, then wanted these indians to leave some indians had already left and gone to the united states or to the united kingdom um, but some some were actually put on airplanes at sent out on the on the screen you you know i have a picture of colonel idi amin who was the ugandan president who started the purge in uganda where people were the where indians were basically asked to leave it's a video i don't think we have time to play a video but um you know i will hand this presentation over to gautam and then maybe it's at, at a later date you can have a look at the video but he's basically telling uh, the indians to leave in this video and all face consequences so this is the other twice migrant diaspora but of course uh, just coming back to the surinamese hindus in the netherlands this is where Suriname is located. This is what it looks like on a map with its capital at Paramaribo. And here you see a picture of the of, of a ship called the Lala Rook, which marked the Indian arrival in Suriname. And this is its location on in the Caribbean uh, area. So between the French and the British Guyanas. Okay, so after the abolition of the indentured labor system, the majority of the Surinamese Hindus lived in the rural areas of Suriname. However, um, as the capital city of Paramaribo uh, held increasing opportunities for education and social mobility, a significant number of the Hindus moved into the city. So in, in, um, in the 1970s, the Dutch government found that their Caribbean colonies were becoming increasingly burdensome and increasingly problematic to manage. And they were spending a lot of money that they did not want to spend on these colonies. Um, they wanted basically to stem the tide of migration into the Netherlands. That's basically what they wanted to do. By the way, the picture that you see on the screen is that of Mai and Bapu. These were the first people to step off the ship into Suriname, the first indentured laborers. So you can see from their clothes that they're wearing a uh, very rough kind of uh, attire from the villages in India. And, um, you know, uh, and they are venerated as, you know, the like deities by the community now in, in Suriname. Uh, this is in Paramaribo, by the way. So the government decided that giving Suriname its independence would stem the migration into the Netherlands. Um, the, the Dutch government uh, arrived at a deal with the Surinamese to grant its independence in 1975. Of course, this was a shock to the general population who had already seen the horrors visited upon the French and the British neighbors uh, after decolonization because they both lapsed into civil war. And uh, because of that, many of the people who had the means started migrating at a greater speed to Netherlands for better opportunities and for better livelihoods. Um, so the second, uh, the Hindustanis, the Surinamese Hindus, um, were the second largest ethnic group to migrate to uh, to the Netherlands after the Afro-Surinamese people or the African Surinamese people. Um, so what I will do now, what I, the story that I will tell you henceforth is 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 drawn from uh, ethnographic research conducted by my colleague and friend, Dr. Priya Swami, who is an anthropologist in the Netherlands. And um, she works with the community. So sh she is a great inspiration for me uh, for my work on the cultural and political connections between the Surinamese community and India. Um, what you see on your screen is very interesting. It's the first book written in Dutch by a Surinamese person, a Hindustani Surinamese person, uh, after coming to the Netherlands about his efforts to assimilate. And it, it's called the Psychodonite Zootwas. 
um, it, it's translated as the sugar was not that sweet. Or in Hindi, chini jo miti na thi. If you are wondering what the Dutch Surinamese people look like, I have a picture of my dear friend Nalini here. And I'm using her picture with her permission, of course. Um, you know, dressing up for a wedding. And I like to use her picture to introduce the Surinamese community to people because uh, this is this is basically um, what they uh, this is bas this basically signifies the way they connect culturally also very very closely to India. These are some other pictures of uh, her, uh, other friends of Nalini as well, um, all members of the Dutch Surinamese community. And this is a family wedding. Uh, Nalini's sister is getting married here, and this is her family. As you can see from uh, from their attire, they're all wearing traditional Indian clothing, um, and they follow um, their ancestral methods of of uh, wedding, of uh, the, the wedding rituals, and so on and so forth. So again, an affirmation of very close cultural ties between the community that has its roots in India, but was uprooted very, very long time ago. Right. So this the, the picture that you have on the screen here is the neighborhood called the Bailma in Amsterdam Southeast, or as it is called in Dutch, Amsterdam Zaurost, where most of the, um, uh, the Hindustani Surinamese settled down after they came to the Netherlands, right? Um, but a lot of the, uh, this is again, a sort of an aerial shot of this of this neighborhood. As you can see, it, it does appear as a middle to lower middle class neighborhood, right? A, a lot of Surinamese people have actually told me that um, they consider the city of The Hague, which is the political capital of the Netherlands, as uh, more conducive to living for Hindus because they have video rental parlors, they have clothing boutiques, they have eateries, temples, and Hindu primary schools as well. This is a picture of a Hindu school in The Hague. Um, one of my friends who's a young woman, uh, she tell, told me once that um, it is better to be in The Hague for the Hindus because it's easy to be Hindu in The Hague. That's, these are her words. I'm quoting her. It's easy to be Hindu in The Hague, right? So just going back to what is happening in the Netherlands, uh, in, in Amsterdam. So as early as 18, 1987, um, the Hindus observed that the Muslims had already got their mosque space. Um, you know, this is also a story of place making, how a community makes its own place. So the Muslims had got a, uh, had their own mosque space. And the Hindus were just trying to find a place to worship. So the earliest gatherings of Hindus in the locality in Bailma started taking place under a tree. Now, this, this beautiful temple that you see on the screen is in Den Helder. It's far away from Amsterdam. And this is also the South Indian community uh, that built this temple. And this is the big mosque, the Grand Mosque in Amsterdam. So the Hindus at this stage had recently arrived in it, 1987, uh, had recently arrived from Suriname and did not have access to public uh, uh, building to offer prayers. Um, so shortly after beginning their gatherings in the open air, the community actors began to vocalize, began to talk about finding a proper space for worship. They wanted to talk to the local government to grant them that space. So they started making a bid for a community center, which will not just be a temple, but they had a vision of a huge, grand, sprawling center that would attend to the religious and cultural needs of the Hindu community. Um, the central deity would be their deity, which they uh, which they call Devi. And then, um, you know, through this process, uh, through this thought process, the first act of requisitioning for the space in Amsterdam to build a temple started. They started writing petitions um, to, the, to the Amsterdam municipality. Um, when the first few petitions were rejected, 
they started framing the whole idea around the fact that they were displaced and they were former from a former colony and therefore they had um, and they were displayed they had been displaced from suriname um, <clears throat> and they had you know they had also difficulties in raising funds and so on and so forth so um, you know the fact that they had no funds to build even a makeshift temple set the whole project back um, and in the meantime the neighboring communities the muslims the ghanaian christians they had their own church the muslims had their own mosque so the hindus were feeling um you know peculiarly kind of deprived of their own place of worship um the local government on its on its uh, part remained very resolute that they will only be allowing a temple that would fit into the strict building and zoning laws of amsterdam um so the and but the 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 request kept on getting rejected repeatedly <clears throat> so in 1997 they reached a compromise and the local uh, government actors um did not want to completely ignore the hindu community because they were a growing community and also a growing body of voters and therefore they were granted the use of a temporary space between 1997 and 1999 they accepted the offer and began to use the space as a temple um while the search for a new plot of land um began um but it never bore fruit the community continued to pray at that makeshift temp uh, of temple space that the municipality had given them um so in uh, although in the years directly after 1999 the government officials were reluctant to ask the community to leave in 2009 the government and the temple community went to court um the court ruled in favor of the local government and the space was ordered to be evacuated and given back to the local government in 2010 um this was a particular shock to the hindu community who had started looking upon the temporary space as their place of worship as their own cultural space right um and it also the fact that the hindu world view assigns a certain specific materiality to even the the idols and the space that the idols and the deities occupy um to move those idols and deities from that space started to be an extremely problematic point uh, point for the hindustani community and to remove the goddess and most of them believed and they have told me this a, a number of them told me this in my conversations with them that they believe that the, the devi will curse them if the deities and the idols were removed from that space which is why they didn't want to do that so in the end uh, the deities were moved into the office space of one of the community members uh, so that they, it would not go into storage for many of the uh, of the people involved this was a blessing as the deities could be visited on festival days for many others it was a disappointment um you know to even think that their gods would be lying in a commercial marketplace was a complete disappointment for uh, many many members of the community in the meantime the neighborhood where they lived in the bailma it had grown into a single income a uh, low class let's say middle class or low class non white enclave um so this is basically the the idols that were moved away from this makeshift temple and these are some pictures of what the bailma would look like on on a normal day um you know there are apartments there with illegal africans sleeping around uh, i mean sleeping um illegal african refugees or or migrants um so the the area also acquired the the, the indistinction let's say of being um a notorious area because of the presence of let's say illegal uh, elements um also the hindus felt that their religious festivals were, were were invisible they were invisible in the public um and this was a source of great number of pain for a lot of people that i spoke to they felt that the um african uh, festival of kwakwe that was uh, celebrated 
uh, had very high visibility in the neighborhood and it symbolized black cultural domination in that public space, which the Hindus not resented, but they wanted their own cultural space. Um, they, they, they grew, they sort of developed this tension, tendency, therefore, to privately celebrate the glory of Hindu culture as an ancient repository, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in their private spaces. So for the Hindu community then in, in, the, in the Netherlands, temples are seen as spaces that serve to transnationally connect them with India. And among many of the people that we speak to, uh, they continue to struggle to establish a purpose-built temple in the neighborhood, in this neighborhood that we're talking about in Balma. Um, and they think that this is because of racialized inequality. Um, so being neither black in Balma nor white, the Hindu community feels somehow sort of uh, sandwiched between the privileged whites and the underprivileged black uh, community. And, you know, they are in this in, 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 in a sort of a tumultuous space, let's say. But on the other hand, uh, this is the uh, this is a picture from the annual Ketoketi festival which they celebrate as the the home the the day that they came to the netherlands they migrated to the netherlands so the twice migrant day let's say um however the surinamese hindus have always been considered in the netherlands as a model minority um they are there is a tendency to describe them as monolithic um socio economically successful minority with little interest in social affairs or politics um, their success is traced to a very strong work ethic um, that is inextricably linked to their racial, religious, and cultural background. It's pretty much the same for most of the Indian minority immigrant communities all over the world. Um, so the Indian laborers who came to Suriname are said to inherently possess a survivor mentality that is reinforced by their strong roots in an ancient religion, namely Hinduism. Um, but the Hindus do feel also that as Hinduism is an outside, quote unquote, outside religion, different from Christianity and Islam, uh, people in powerful positions in the Netherlands have continued to ignore the fact that there is no Hindu temple in the area. And the people feel this. The Hindus feel this. Um, one of the one of the people I spoke to also expressed that Hindus are marginal because their religious beliefs are misunderstood. They are mythologized. People think that Hindu Hinduism is a mythology, or um, or it's it's a bunch of superstition. Um, so the religious beliefs have traditionally been misunderstood in Western societies. So um, this is what she said, and I will quote: "No one really understands what a temple really is. Um, yet the the girl the woman also felt." that building a temple could powerfully alter um, relations between India in the and the Netherlands. They also have these grand fantasies about a huge uh, temple that would um, that would basically make the Hindu community very, very proud. Right. So it is linked to cultural space making or place making. It is also linked to a, a sense of communal pride. Uh, for a community that has been traditionally deprived, uh, but in a in a largely non uh, in a largely Western setting, uh, they are now striving to make for themselves a cultural space against other competing cultural spaces, right? So I basically wanted to um, complete my story about the Surinamese Hindus with uh, two cultural artifacts um, that I also um, have sourced from the Tropen Museum uh, in Amsterdam. This is basically a fud painting or a cloth painting from Rajasthan. And someone from Suriname, I don't know who, um, requisitioned it in the year 1999 to be painted. And if you look closely, you would find that the central character in this painting or in this sort of mural is Amitabh Bachchan. So it is essentially, you know, trying to give Amitabh Bachchan a rather messianic uh, quality here. So he is the king. He is also 
you know, he's he's you know, he's everywhere in this picture. He's in the pictures. He's in he's a king here. He's also in a you know uh, performing certain miracles and so on and so forth. So this is one kind of cultural legacy that um, the, uh, the in, in, in the film industry has with the Surinamese community in Suriname and in the Netherlands. Um, where there is a specific admiration and a specific fan following, let's say, for um, Bollywood icons such as Amitabh Bachchan. Um, and this is the second artifact that I wanted to share with you. This is an artistic rendering of, again, of Amitabh Bachchan. He is a big star for the Surinamese people, again, from the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam. And uh, here, you know, this is done by a Surinamese artist. I, I have, I... I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the artist, but he is definitely a Surinamese artist. And here he depicts the three kind of phases of Amitabh Bachchan's um, acting life and his the characters that he plays on screen. Um, but I also have to tell you that I at one time visited, have visited a couple of Hindustani weddings. And it's very significant to also mention that um, there is a tendency to revive uh, the past of uh, of of the film in, you know the film music and uh, cinema in general indian cinema in general among the hindustani community in the netherlands so they the, the performances of, of on the stage were traditionally of the of music from the 50s and 60s not the new songs that the youngsters would be singing and on the other hand, you would also see the choreographed dance performances by younger people who are dancing to the new Bollywood tunes. So there is um, there is the uh, you know the carrying forward of a particular cultural legacy, um, but there is also adoption of newer forms of cultural linkages between India and um, and this community that I started with calling the forgotten Indian diaspora or the forgotten twice migrants. Um, I am going to stop here and um, I would then take questions um, if there are any. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to take questions if there are any. Please, uh, first of all, thanks for this wonderful presentation. I packed with Thank a you. lot of information. We have, let me share it. Rather than question, it's a kind of my observation that um, we have talked more specifically about the present generation of twice migrant Hindustanis who were born in the Netherlands to one or uh, from the parents or uh, from mother or father and who belong to the first generation Surinamese Hindustanis, either born or migrated for, uh, from Suriname, that is from the Indian origin. So the uh, that nomenclature Hindustani, I guess it itself uh, may require some kind of clarification for the twice migrant Hindustanis born in the Netherlands uh, for, for in, uh, and an individual uh, has the option of a Dutch identity. So the Hindustani identity with a surname uh, or a Suriname background, uh, they are always uh, carrying dual identity. So how much this kind of dual identity um, create obstacle in their life? OK, so basically the thing is that um, the people that I'm talking about, uh, the, the first generation that migrated from the Netherlands to from the from Suriname to the Netherlands is still alive, yeah. primarily. Yeah. So, um, so I'm talking about the first, the second, and also the third generation. So, the younger people, people who are younger, the, the generation after us, for instance, is the third generation uh, migrants from Suriname, um, and all of them carry um, all of them in terms of their names, for example, in uh, all of them have. Uh, very specific Caribbean Creole uh, Surinamese names. So, for instance, my friend, that the picture of whom I used, her name is Nalini Harnam. Mm -hmm. So, as you can yeah. see from the yeah. from her name, there is nothing um, Dutch about her name at all, right? Her uh, her best friend, uh, her name is Gita. Mm -hmm. There is another friend of ours 
whose name is Sheila. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have very specific Indian um, Indian sounding names, mm -hmm. uh, although there's the, the, the spellings might be different. The spellings might be more, uh, you know, suited to the local um, local ethos, let's say. So, uh, and I call them Surinamese Hindustanis because they call themselves Surinamese Hindustani. So they call themselves Dutch Hindustanis or Suriname Hindustanis. Actually, the word they use is Sarnami. In, in this is a Bhojpuri word called Sarnami. So if you ask me, they would say Sarnami for to uh, describe themselves. So they are Sarnami oh. Dutch. They all the, oh. the current, the present and uh, the second, uh, the second and the third generation are fluent Dutch speakers. The first generation also learned to speak Dutch. So they are all fluent Dutch speakers. So it is, uh, you know, they have tried a lot to blend in. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the Suriname women I saw are married to Dutch guy, to Dutch men and vice versa. Also, um, number of Suriname men have Dutch wives. So not a lot, but there is there are families with which are mixed families. Um, so, the, you know, there is always a dissonance between how much you want to assimilate and how much you can assimilate. Right. So that is the whole point of, of diaspora studies. Right. That's what all, we are all trying to do, trying to figure out how much the diaspora has wanted to assimilate and how much it has assimilated. And the third question that arises from the previous two is how much they have been allowed to assimilate. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there are there are in, in the Netherlands, you will find certain areas that are earmarked for Hindustanis. I mean, they live, the only Hindustanis live there. So, you know, it, that, that, there is what is known as ghetto formation. No doubt about that. Okay. So the, I guess uh, that uh, with this transfer of sovereignty to Suriname and the uh, option to settle in that part of, uh, that uh, in Netherlands, I guess the identity of these Indians continuously underwent further changes and uh, negotiations and further reimagining of their past land yes indeed indeed um there is a lot of reimagining and for the twice migrants it is doubly difficult because they they have to you know reimagine two kinds of cultural okay. pasts one yes. is the their roots from india where they come from primarily from up the bhojpuri speaking areas of up and bihar and second, their cultural past from Suriname. So it's it's sort of um, you know the the marriage between these two cultural pasts that they carry with them when they come to the Netherlands. And the the if you talk about the third generation, then the third generation has to negotiate three cultural um, ethos. Dutch, uh, they have to negotiate Dutch, Suriname, and Indian. You know, it becomes triply difficult for the third generation then, because then their identities are kind of split. Okay. okay. Uh, Taruni Ghoshal, the has an observation for you. Uh, she's telling that uh, as far as she knows that the purge movement by the idiom in was not really successful as the Gujaratis are still dominating in countries like Kenya and Nairobi still today. Just mm -hmm. an information yeah, that she wants to share with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Okay. 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 And the, uh, there are a few questions. Uh, let me take. First of all, um, that uh, how are you viewing the migrant problem that India is facing right now as large part of your discussion is based on identity of labor? Attitude labor and um, how, how far the migrant problem that India is facing right now? What is your take on it? Oh, the, the migrant, I have a problem with um, with actually calling the, the workers, the internal workers as migrants. Uh, they are they are unorganized workers. You know, by calling them migrants, you are basically undermining their contribution to the economic systems or the or the or the economic sort of system that they are contributing to. They are migrating not for um, you know they are migrating because of lack of opportunity, and they are coming and working in the cities 
as unorganized workers. So I would call them unorganized workers and not migrants. Um, and they all obviously have an option. Uh, they, you know, they would not like to leave their villages. Of course, some people leave because they want a better life. But a lot of people would like to stay back and not leave. But they, uh, people are forced to leave because of lack of opportunity, because of lack of a livelihood in in uh, in the village that they come from. Uh, so and uh, so there is a. So I have I have a problem with you know with articulating this uh, this group of people or this uh, community of people who work um, in cities and come from different parts of the country as migrants. I mean, I think it trivializes their contribution a great deal. And the other thing I want to say also is that the um, all of our big cities are, are made up of migrants. Delhi is a migrant city. Mumbai is a migrant city. People come from all over the all over the country to live there. But an IT worker or a white collar worker is never trivialized as a migrant. But these unorganized workers who don't have paper contracts or don't have social security are trivialized as migrants. So this 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 um, this kind of a uh, nomenclature has to you know has to be looked at very critically. Thanks. Okay. Um, there is another observation from Shoykut Chakraborty. The MP is bringing MP from KNU. He's telling that the, the title, the term transnational, can be substituted by globalized, which has a sense of exploitative politics, uh, both from from economical point of view and from from colonial point of view. Whereas the term transnational has the same sub transcendence from hegemonic and exploitative discourse. So, um, do you have any problem uh, with using the term globalized in this context? Um, well, I think transnational suits the the idea of my work better. Okay. I'll tell you why. Because transnationalism is uh, it doesn't mean transcendental or transcendence. Um, transnationalism is basically referring to the inter intra nation intra nation connections that diasporas build among themselves or across diasporas in different parts of the world. And it also means the link that they have with their homeland. So in the context of the diaspora, in the context of diaspora studies, I think transnational fits better with uh, the communities that we are engaging with. For instance, the Surinamis or, the, or any twice migrant community um, in the world. Um, so what I am, you know, what I am engaged with here is primarily the the um, the the cultural and political legacy or the cultural and political linkages that these communities have with their homeland. It might, you know, sort of move into the into the realm of discussing um, hardcore politics in terms of long distance nationalism. Um, in you know in the current scenario of Hindu extremism and so on and so forth, I did not touch upon it in my presentation because I wanted a you know a, this is a it's basically I'm starting with my research on this community. So when I have more to share, I will tell you more about what I think. But at this moment in time, I think uh, transnational is a better term to use here. Okay, so there is another question from Shomostri Sarkar. Is telling that, mm -hmm. ma'am, do you think a uh, retaining of Hindu names or Indian mm -hmm. names, which we find in all the Trinidadian Indians, like having names after Hindu deities, in a mm -hmm. way re intensifies their Indianness and they con consciously don't want to leave behind their homeland? What is your take? They would like to. They would like to re reinforce their Indianness. I can tell you from experience, experience in my conversations with members of the community that they are quite content and quite happy to um, to reinforce their identity as Indians. And uh, they are extremely um, unhappy about the fact that expat Indians, like people like me, um, 
um, I'm not talking about myself. I, I have many Suriname friends, but they are very unhappy about the fact that expat Indians don't mix with them a lot. So they would like to be more closer with the expat Indian community. And they think that, you know, these guys are from our country. You know, they, they think of themselves ultimately as Indians. Um, you know, although they are struggling with these, you know, these triple identities or dual identities, mm -hmm. ultimately, a lot of them think of themselves as Indians. So a number of them would introduce themselves to me and say that we are from India as well. And then when they tell me their name, I would guess that they are not. But they introduce themselves, a lot of them, as we are from India as well. I mean, like, if, you know, they want to reinforce the fact that they have this connection with India. We can critically look at it. We can look at it as, you know, some kind of a reinforcement of a Hindu identity or a stringent kind of uh, awakening of Hinduism or, or the Hindu identity or things like that. But a number, a, 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 you know, people I have had conversations with, they are, um, you know, they want to take a lot of pride in their uh, identity as Indians oh. or people who have roots in India. And they want on most of and they would always name their children uh, with um, a, um, a Hindu name and for the for the sake of efficacy, because they live in the Netherlands, they also probably have a like a shorter or a second name, which is Dutch in nature yes, yes, or a Western name. So they would have, have names like Dinesh Ruben. So Dinesh is the real name, but Ruben is only yeah, yeah, for the yeah. yeah. Okay, another question is there. Yeah. Hinduism has heritage, culture, and deep ethical values in spreading mm -hmm. good things to humanity. Why are Western countries still thinking our country a mythological world? Share your views on that. Well, the, the first thing is the you know the lack of awareness um about um anything which is outside of their nearest periphery of vision um so uh, you know dutch people would you know like a regular dutch person or a regular any person like an, even an american if you ask a regular american person it would be very difficult for them to find india on a map if it's not written on the globe or the, or on the world map they wouldn't they really wouldn't be able to find india on a map so um it's you know, and the, the education that they receive is extremely Eurocentric. Um, so anybody who, who who knows anything about Hinduism or about India, about Eastern cultures or about any other culture except for their own culture is making an extra effort to learn that. Right. So you would find a number of Indologists in the Netherlands who have had years and years of research and study who are uh, Indophiles and Indologists, and therefore they know about India and Hinduism and so on and so forth. But a general, uh, a, like a regular person on the street um, is, is completely ignorant. And therefore, if, you know, if presented with, when presented with a religious ethos of Hinduism, um, which, is, which is, as you would agree, highly mythologized as well, um, they think this is something very esoteric and something very sort of unbelievable and it's all myth and all sort of legend and uh, there is nothing, nothing sort of uh, specific that one can, of course, one can take away lots of messages from Hindu myths and legends, but it's, it's difficult for them to sort of, um, uh, you know, understand it as a as a matter of faith or a matter of cultural significance for another um so it's it's primarily this sort of lack of awareness oh, okay. Oh, okay there is another question from joita shaw he's telling that mm -hmm. what do you think hindustanis fail to assimilate into the dutch culture while mm -hmm. muslims and africans manage to find a better space within the Dutch social structure. What's the reason behind that? Well, the, I, you know, like I said, the Hindus did not uh, find it difficult. I mean, like 
every minority migrant community finds it difficult to assimilate. The Muslims and the Blacks have also found it extremely difficult to assimilate. Um, but the point is that the Muslims and the, the Muslim migrants in the Netherlands, if you look at the uh, areas that they come from, most of them are Turks and from uh, North Africa, so Lebanon uh, and Morocco, right? So the Turks have a different kind of a social and financial and economic position in the society. The Moroccans have a different social, financial, uh, economic position in the society. The blacks primarily come from different parts of Africa, but mostly um, areas that were colonized by the Dutch. But they too have uh, a different uh, socioeconomic uh, space in the society. What I what the Hindus basically feel that they were able to because of the for the Muslims, because of the, you know, the leadership of the Turks who are economically better off and socially better off than the Hindustanis because of their leadership, they could find a space for themselves to build a place of worship, the Grand Mosque. Um, but because the Hindustanis, even though they are a model minority, they are law abiding citizens, which you know for this is their narrative this is what they feel they are model they are law abiding they are also educated and in good positions but because of a lack of leadership or community leadership they have failed to find this space to build a temple in uh, which would which could compete with the other minorities the muslims or uh, the afro surinamese or the or the other african communities oh, okay Mm. See, there is a question. There are two questions. Um, what are the literary narratives of the twice migrant communities? In, uh, what, what are the what are the, uh, uh, what are the literary narratives of the twice migrant community? Okay, um, if you're asking for what texts to uh, yes, read for text? to uh, to uh, know more about the twice migrant communities. There is uh, Bridge Lal. Um, I will give you the name of the book later. I don't remember the name of the book, but uh, Bridge Lal has written extensively on the twice migrant community. He's a Fijian Australian historian. And then there is a recent book by Ashutosh Kumar that focuses specifically on the migrant, uh, the indentured labor diaspora and the indentured labor community and the you know how the diaspora was formed so he's also a historian i think from he's from DU, and he traces the history of um, the the formation of this diaspora um as for the twice migrants in the netherlands there are some dutch historians and dutch social scientists who've done some work uh, i can i can give you references if you like um uh, but i don't remember them offhand right now there is a Social uh, political scientist called Ruben Gauri Charan, who has written a couple of books on the narratives of the twice migrants in the Netherlands. Then there is another social scientist called Chandrakant Chuni, who's also done some work on the on the twice migrant community in the Netherlands. So there is there is some work, but there isn't a lot. Okay. See, uh, this is just out of the curiosity since you have a considerable amount of ethnographic knowledge about this twice migrants so are they rooted to india with just this communal pride they harbor towards a very ancient religion or do they still have a more developed sense of belonging to india as a whole do they ah. ever want to move back to this country Good question. Um, so let me just tell you that uh, if 83% of the Hindustanis who migrated to the Netherlands were Hindus, 18% uh, were also Muslim. So you also have a Muslim uh, Hindustani community, right? Um, so there is a there is a bit of a diversity there. So it's not just you know uh, adhering to Hinduism as a monolithic uh, religion or rootedness in um, in the religion itself that it that they connect with India, but as I am um, as I am unraveling as I learn more about this community that they um, the rootedness is more about the villages they come from. They would be more interested to go back to the village their ancestors came from. They tell me that I want to go back to my great grandfather's village. I want to see what it looks like now. I want to see if his house exists. 
I want to see the fields that he tended to. I want to see the, the streams and rivers that he bathed in. These are the kind of, you know, you might dismiss it as nostalgia, but this is the kind of um, rootedness, or this is the kind of um, thought process that the, that the community has. It's not just religion. Uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, it would be really harsh to dismiss it just, just as a communal pride or as religious sort of belonging. No, I think it is much more rooted to their, um, their, uh, you know, exactly to their roots in the village, for instance. You know, they would want to go back to their districts. They know some of them have traced themselves or their families back to a particular district and a village. So they know that they came from their grandfather came from this particular village in this particular district um, in UP or in Bihar. And uh, if you when I asked them, do you want to go back and look at what your village looks like now? And they were like, of course, I really want to go. And some of them have also gone to their back to their villages and they had really very good experiences of going back. But if but um, do they want to come back to India? I do not know. I'm not sure. I haven't asked that question to them. But I do feel that, you know, since they have made their place already in the Netherlands, um, I don't think they would want to return because it's already the third or the fourth generation now. And um, they are pretty much rooted in uh, their communities and in their society in general um, in, in the Netherlands. This is about the Dutch Surinamese. Um, I'm not sure if they would want to return. They definitely come back a lot, even for shopping. A lot of them come from their wedding shopping to India, to Delhi and to Bombay. Uh, they love coming to India. But uh, if you ask, uh, if I, I, I really, I haven't asked them this question. Um, thank you. I, the next time I'm with my Surinamese interlocutors and friends, I'm going to ask them that question. <laughs> OK. You also, you, uh, you also talk about. Uh, that Indian community sandwiched between the privileged whites and the mm -hmm. unprivileged black. Mm. So I find it that this the explanation uh, it is a bit problematic as it overshadows the dual racial threat and twice segregation also. What is your take on it? The reason I say that is because this is the this is the feeling that the Hindustanis have about themselves. That on the one side, there is the privileged Dutch white people who consider them as, you know, like a people who are sometimes causing a problem, asking for a temple space or whatever. And um, on the other hand, you have the, the, the blacks who are um, who are more visible in the community or in the neighborhood. That's what they say. That's what you will see if you visit Bailma that you will always see a, a black cultural presence in that area. I am not making a comment on whether it is, uh, you know, whether they are, they are right in their assessment or wrong. I'm just saying what I observed, that when you go there, you will find a black cultural presence, but you, it would be hard to find a Hindustani cultural presence. It is there. It's, it's not like uh, there are no shops or there are no, um, you know, specific areas that you have Hindustanis living in. But the black cultural presence is much more sharp and much more there for everyone to see. So the Hindustanis therefore feel a little bit, um, you know, sort of sandwiched between a dominant black presence and, of course, the white um, uh, uh, society, which, of course, sees them as, you know, some of them see them as part of the Dutch society and the others see them as problematic, but they don't engage a lot with them. Okay. okay. So yes, it, it, does, it can have a lot of racialized overtones. Um, I'm not saying that the Hindustani community has any kind of um, critical understanding of race. No, they don't. They also, uh, you know, have certain kind of connect certain kind of racialized relationships with the black neighbors uh, which is very very problematic but uh, if you when when you talk to them this is the sense you get that they find themselves or feel themselves sandwiched between the dominant blacks and the uh, privileged whites okay yeah, one last 
last observation on my part it is purely my observation mm-hmm. and uh, since you were telling uh, about that in the fijian diaspora also so the, uh, mm-hmm. that um, i feel that many in the fijians have left uh, fiji and pre-settled in the uh, developed pacific re- region and uh, more precisely pacific region countries and especially in uh, in australia so in the wake yeah. of uh, secondary migration this indo fijian mm. have realized that their social and cultural distance from subcontinental indians i guess to some extent get to be narrowed by a shared ethnicity and in and in the whole process somehow they have developed a pacific identity and have constructed a transnational space uh, space around fiji as the new center largely excluding the cultural hip india do you also agree with it um i will have to uh, go back to i have will have to read a bit more about the fijians i am uh, my knowledge of the fijian minority uh, fijian diaspora is not uh, as um, sort of extensive or, or as a first hand as it is with the suriname twice migrants so i will not be able to uh, i will not answer your question right now but if, when i go back and read and then i'll come back to you okay okay Okay, okay. So thanks a lot for speaking to us about twice migrant uh, Indians, and yeah. I'm sure uh, that listeners who attended the session really enjoyed your your presentation, and particularly um, those pictures and uh, absolutely mesmerizing. And we appreciate you making time in your busy schedule um, to speak to us. And thank you again for your time. did such a great job for us and we loved it and i have had nothing but glowing comments in the chat box about your presentation both the pictures and your commentary the you are thank a natural you. speaker okay. <laughs> thank you very much thank you that's very nice to hear uh, yeah <laughs> okay. thank you so much i just wanted to i was just curious and i really liked your lecture on the suriname hindus and i was just curious i wanted to know whether the nature of uh, assimilation of culture of the adapted country in the first and second generation of migrants uh, was is different from the subsequent like how are they rooted uh, to the adapted country and how do they negotiate with their mother uh, original country in the in the subsequent generations in the third and the fourth uh, generations and how is it different from the first two yeah so basically thank you dr shri rupa for that question um the uh, let me tell you about the third and fourth generation migrants uh, they are more dutch than their uh, parents and grandparents of course because they were born there and raised there um although they all most of them have indian names or hindu names let's say if they are you know, surinamese muslims they have muslim names but um there is a very strong um cultural connect with india through films and through music um with for even the second and third and fourth generation india hindus and muslims uh, the twice migrants um you would find them you know watching indian movies with a lot of interest um although you know most of the indian movies there are released with dutch subtitles i don't know if they understand any hindi but the the parents know a little bit of hindi and uh, the first generation of course speaks bhojpuri uh, and they have a very interesting language called hindustans which is a mix of hindi bhojpuri and a bit of dutch a little bit of dutch so if someone is speaking hindustans in front of you you would probably follow if you know a little bit of hindi um so the younger generation does not know a lot of hindustans they don't speak it much they only speak dutch but their major connection with india is through travel with their families and through cultural products such as cinema okay. thank you thank you okay, okay. thanks thanks a lot thanks a lot for this wonderful presentation look thank forward to meet you soon thanks thanks thank you thanks for inviting okay. me thank you again okay. <laughs> thank you to the teacher thank you thank you uh, 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 yeah uh, we move on uh, to uh, do we have uh, uh, our third speaker with us uh, yeah oh okay yeah yeah 
we have today uh, our third speaker, Professor Lopa Mudra Basu, uh, who is a professor of English at University of Wisconsin Start. She grew up in Calcutta, India, and attended the University of Delhi, where she received her BNMA degrees. She received her PhD in English from the City University of New York. She is the author of Ayad Akhtar, The American Nation and Its Others After 9-11, Homeland Insecurity, which was published by Lexington Books in December 2018. She is the co-editor of Passage to Manhattan, Critical Essays on Mila Alexander, published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing in 2009. Her articles, interviews, and reviews have been published in South Asian Review, Nebula, Social Text, Journal of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies, Remarking Pan in the Anthologies, Rites of Passage in Postcolonial Women's Writing, uh, published in, by Rodopi in 2010, Drawing from Life, Memory and Subjectivity in Comic uh, uh, Art, published by the University of Mississippi Press in 2013, Masks of Threat, South Asian Racialization and Belonging After 9-11, published by Lexington in 2016. A History of Indian Poetry in English, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2016. Her current scholarly interests include trauma studies, post 9-11 American literature, graphic narratives, and post-colonial poetry. Her poetry has been published in Postcolonial Text, Journal of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies, Barstow and Grant, the Hitchlit Review, and the Poetry Calendar of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets. Today, she'll be speaking on the topic, Drawing Men, Representations of Postcolonial Masculinity in Sarnath Banerjee's Graphic Narratives and Art Exhibits. Over to you, ma'am. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, Gautam, uh, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful three-day uh, web conference. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me properly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. Perfect. So, uh, thank you. So I will um, initially, uh, you know, uh, read, and then at, at a certain point, I will switch over to a PowerPoint to show you some slides from the uh, newer uh, graphic narratives of Sarnath Banerjee. So part of this uh, work has been published in a special issue on graphic novels which came out from South Asian Review and has also been published uh, as a separate uh, anthology by Rutledge, uh, edited by Kavita Daya. But in this uh, presentation today, I will try to trace um, Sarnath Banerjee's work to the larger field of masculinity studies within postcolonial uh, studies. And also, I will include some of his more recent work, including Doab Dil, which was published in 2019. Okay. Um, Sarnath Banerjee's graphic narratives and his more recent graphic commentaries and art exhibits have continued to explore questions of postcolonial Indian masculinities. In this paper, I will highlight the existing lacunae of masculinity studies within South Asian literary and cultural studies, a field which has focused more extensively and deliberately on figures of women as allegorical representations of nationalism, neglecting how masculinity is deeply intertwined with nation formation. In contemporary representations of Indian nationalism, Banerjee's focus on the rise of the neoliberal economy and environmental degradation, masculinity has emerged as a zone of crisis and anxiety. Banerjee's 2007 graphic novel, The Barn Owl's Wondrous Capers, foregrounds postcolonial masculinity as a true masculinity in shaping national and diasporic identities in South Asia. Since then, Chandrima Chakraborty's study, Masculinity, Asceticism, Hinduism, Past and the Present Imaginings of India in 2011, and a collection of edited essays, South Asian Masculinities, Men and Political Crises in 2015, as well as Harleen, Harleen Singh's essay, Graphics of Freedom, Colonial Terrorists, and Postcolonial Revolutionaries in Indian Comics, constitute a critical intervention in deploying masculinity as a framework of analysis. But predating these scholarly interventions, masculinity as an object of scholarly investigation can be traced back to Frank Fanon's black skin, white mass. Fanon draws attention to various neuroses and sexual traumas engendered by colonialism. In studying psychological disorders of men and women in his native Antilles, 
Fanon draws attention to many pages, deep-seated negrophobia and its corollary, the desire for whiteness to the choice of a white love object. In the case of colonized a black woman, uh, uh, she sacrifices all sense of self to be loved by a white man, while for a black man, the conquest of white women seems to become a way of reversing colonial hierarchies of racial superiority and subjugation. Fanon also elaborates on the pervasive discourse of reducing black men to mere objects of sex and the massive obsession with black men's sexuality within the framework of which the act of lynching becomes inevitably an attempt to castrate a black man. Fanon's concepts of sexual conquest and mimicry of the master by desiring the same love object as the master become theorized in Homi Baba and find expression in the babus of the Barnaul's wondrous capers who desire European women. However, the babus of Calcutta, unlike the natives of uh, uh, Fanon's homeland, do not despise native women. Their attempts to mimic their masters is to follow in their path of libertinism, not necessarily to marry a white woman for social ascendancy. Racial intermixing, however desirable whiteness may be to the Indian imagination, is taboo among caste Hindus who are protective of their caste lineage. Another notable theorist who deploys masculinity for an understanding of historical events is Ashish Nandi. In his uh, book, The Intimate Enemy, uh, Nandi talks about the duality of colonialism, casting a European civilization as aggressive and hyper-masculine, while Indian or Eastern values are juxtaposed as almost childlike and feminine. Nandi studies this trope uh, uh, with respect to many uh, colonial authors like Kipling. He focuses on Gandhi as a thinker who is able to change this paradigm. Gandhi, uh, Gandhi notes, is able to successfully reject a hyper-masculinist track and refashion himself as almost a woman or a child. In rejecting a Eurocentric hyper-masculinity as normative, Gandhi embraces androgynous aspects of Indian culture and self-fashions himself as a feminine and childlike figure. Gandhi thus presents an image of resistance and defiance which subverts colonial hyper-masculine and militaristic norms. Chandrima Chakraborty's work on masculinity like uh, takes this inquiry further and explores the changes to ascetic masculinity from the works of Bonkin Chandra Chatterjee, Ramunath Tagore, to the representations of Gandhi in Raja Rao's Kathapura. Drawing from these scholarly endeavors in masculinity studies, I explore masculinity as a trope in Sanatanji's graphic novels. Instead of an ascetic masculinity, or one which charts the militarization of uh, ascetics in the form of anti-colonial resistance, Sanatanji's early works follows more of a framework of masculinity as an aggressive performance of sexual conquest and a trope of mimicry of the lifestyle of colonial masters. Of course, Banerjee is portraying a narrow substrata of colonial society, the Bengali male urban elites. In these early portrayals, the trope of mimicry allows for the subversion of many grand narratives of empire. However, this aggressive performance of masculinity gradually rings hollow and inadequate when Banerjee turns his attention to the crisis of global capitalism and environmental degradation in his later works. Minalini Sita's 1995 study, Colonial Masculinity, remains important in the analysis of the discourse of the, quote, man manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali, unquote, in, in the late 19th century. Sita argues that these categories were produced and disseminated in the 19th century to facilitate the functioning of the political economy of colonialism in 19th century India. She studies the specific aspects of 19th century Indian history to highlight the growth of the hierarchical categorization of various races and ethnic groups within India into manly and unmanly races. Groups from the Northwest like Pathans and Punjabis are characterized as manly based on their military prowess, while Bengali men were characterized as effeminate given their low representation in the British army. At the same time, Bengali men were overrepresented in the civil service and Babus, a category of men that Banerjee uses Nakale's words to define as, quote, a native who is Indian in flesh and blood and English in taste and opinion, unquote, uh, Sinha studies the controversy surrounding the British public service examinations, which sought repeatedly to lower age limits to discourage the entry of uh, undesirable or unmanly Bengali natives into the service, while ostensibly, ostensibly attempting to increase representation of na uh, native Indian candidates into the service, there was an 
undeniable anxiety about the perceived overrepresentation of Bengalis in the civil service, which would be diluting the manly character of the colonial administration. Strategy focuses on the trope of masculinity as it is played out in the realm of sexual conquests and rivalries outside the purview of the respectable bourgeois marriage, both for the British colonizers and the Bengali elites. Um, the Barnall's uh, Wondrous Capers posits a similarity of interest between colonial administrators and the uh, elite class of native population in their relationships to women as objects of sexual gratification. <laughs> The similarity of masculine rivalries of the British colonizers and Bengali elites deconstructs the binary of the manly Englishman and the effeminate Bengali. <coughs> this binary circulated in much of the 19th century official discourse, as documented by Sinha. In many instances, the native Bengali elites exceed their colonialist counterparts in their exaggerated performance of masculine pride, sexuality, and ostentatious consumption. Banerjee seems to be deconstructing images of Bengali unmanliness in his presentation of vignettes from Calcutta's colonial past. Banerjee's depiction of Bengali elites plays on the trope of colonial mimicry as analyzed by Homi Bhabha in his essay of Mimicry and Man, The Ambivalence of Colonial History. Bhabha uses Macaulay's framework of the creation of a Babu class in analyzing mimicry. Macaulay famously wanted to create a Babu class, a class, to quote, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect, unquote. Macaulay's ambition, according to Papa, was to produce a mimic man, a kind of character that populates the fiction of Kipling, Foster, and Naipaul, and who represents, quote, a flawed colonial mimesis in which to be anglicized is emphatically not to be English, unquote. This ambivalence of mimicry, quote, almost the same but not white, end quote, for Baba has the potential for disrupting the established power hierarchies between the colonizer and the colonized, and the potential to destroy and dismember the colonial state's powerful apparatus. Baba ends his essay with the image of the Bible, a symbol of the ideological mission of empire, observed by a missionary in Bengal as an object of being used for scrap paper, wrapping paper, or bartered in markets by natives who receive copies of the book from missionaries. This example emphasizes how an artifact of empire can be appropriated periodically by the colonized, disrupting the mission and ideological work of empire. In Banerjee's representation of colonized Babus, even though Babus appear to be emulating tropes of promiscuity and ostentatious consumption exhibited by the colonizers, there are sly inversions enacted by the Babus, which are aimed to periodically debunk the power and grandeur of empire. Unlike the strict colonial definition of Babus as cler clerks of the empire, Banerjee clusters the wealthy aristocracy and the emerging professional class of native administrators in his concept of the Babu class. Banerjee also par parodies the colonial stereotype of the new English education foisted on Babus by portraying characters like Babu Joy Mitro, an illiterate who drives around his carriage holding a newspaper upside down. Another uh, pursuit of the Calcutta Babus that Banerjee highlights is their obsession with recreational drug use. Babu Shibchandra Mukherjee from forms a bird club in which each member is given the names of a bird and are expected to wobble accordingly. These episodes of male friendship, facilitated by shared indulgence of alcohol and narcotics, alternates with rivalries with members of this group. Many rivalries take the form of ostentatious display of wealth and conspicuous consumption. For example, Babus try to outdo each other in the lavish celebrations of the weddings of their pets. For both groups, sexuality seems to be concentrated outside the confines of the bourgeois uh, marriage. Masculinity is enacted through hedonistic engagement with women who are either European seductresses like Madame Grand, or who exist outside the pale of uh, bourgeois respectability like prostitutes in uh, areas of Calcutta, uh, frequented by many of the Babus. Colonial masculinity thus gets performed through intense rivalries between officers of the British administration, rivalries which are mimicked by the Bengali Babu class. 
Banerjee's depiction of masculinity of native elites premised on their hedonistic quest for extramarital sexuality and ostentatious consumerism is in sharp contrast to the trope of Hindu ascetic masculinity, which was premised on the practice of celibacy, renunciation of worldly pleasures and discipline. Chandri Machakraborty's work on 19th century masculinity, as well as Harleen Singh's more recent study of the depictions of nationalist heroes like Bagha Jyotin, Chandrasekhar Azad in Amar Chitra Katha comics, also emphasize how men involved with the anti-colonial struggle, whether real life heroes or those appearing in the fiction of Bonkim Chandra's uh, Chatterjee's on Anandamat were associated with the practice of brahmacharya or celibacy, which was constructed as a source of physical power against the colonial enemy. Celibacy and the practice of self-discipline were supposed to confer young men with the power necessary to fight the British Empire. Banerjee's men, colonial administrators, native elites, and the present generation do not seem to be influenced by this ideology of Hindu male asceticism. Instead, they seem to be pursuing a path of pleasure in imitation of colonial rulers, but also subverting some of the paradigms of the colonial enterprise. Even though the Babu seem to be emulating codes of conduct displayed by British administrators, there are subtle departures not only, that not only emphasize their status as mimic men, not quite not white, uh, their actions sometimes radically undercut established certainties of empire. One example of this is when one Babu, Tarachand, is not allowed entry into the fashionable Calcutta department store, Whiteway and Ladlow on Chorungi to buy the most expensive Peter's perfume worn by the British Queen and Lady Hastings. Tarachand does acquire this perfume from a Portuguese sailor and then empties the bottle on his horse's testicles, a, little, a coveted object of the colonial economy. Even though Babus had often imitated your empire's consumer culture, uh, he, he is, this particular character is strategically denied full participation because of his race. Fetishized objects of the colonial economy are stripped of their aura by mimic men who will always be excluded from colonial society. In another panel, of another Babu, Nilamoni Day, an ancestor of a later character on Darkosh, urinates on the lawns of the go governor's mansion. He is fined many times, he used to do this and pay the fine, uh, and he returns to this ritualized performance of psychological disgusts that parodies the colonial regime and its aura of grandeur. Codes of masculinity which seem to be uh, replicated in, post in the post-colonial generation do not really encompass the strong rivalries of British and Bengali elites. Instead, the closest correspondence can be seen in the manner in which the present generation of men replicate modes of heterosexual conduct, which were followed by their predecessors. Mangar Ghosh is a scion of a North Calcutta Zamindar family, and he supplies information based on his family's genealogy to the narrator in his quest for the lost copy of his grandfather's book, uh, the journal kept by the wandering Jew Abravanel. Although he attempts to separate himself from the sexual escapades of his ancestors by declaring that he leads a straight life with his wife and two children, the reader is aware of the deep hypocrisy of this self-presentation. Only a few pages before this declaration, Mandar is seen in some of the most risque panels of the graphic novel to be involved in an extramarital affair with a young woman who is a soccer player. What seems to have changed between the sexual mores of Mandar's ancestors and himself is that the norm of bourgeois companionate marriage has forced a careful camouflage of extramarital sexuality, which had previously been flaunted as a sign of masculinity. Extramarital uh, sexuality is a deliberately hidden layer in the, in the composition of post-colonial masculinity. In addition to the tropes of colonial mimicry and the performance of promiscuous heterosexuality that I have analyzed so far, Banerjee's graphic novel explores another layer of masculinity, which I argue has deeper implications for the present moment. This is Banerjee's exploration of masculine subject formation as one based on the figure of the traveler or nomad, one not comfortably accommodated by the modern nation state, but one occupying the uh, figure of the migrant minority, a uh, presence concomitant with the development of the modern nation state. This aspect of masculinity is a buried layer in the graphic novel, but one that can be excavated through attention to figures like the Jewish migrant of the 18th century and his contemporary counterpart, the high tech worker of contemporary globalization. Amir Mufti in his book, uh, uh, enlightenment in the colony argues that the birth of modern European nation states inaugurates a change in the earlier lives of Jews in the ghettos of various countries, 
and the gain of various rights of citizenship. In spite of this, Jews remain socially, socially and culturally unassimilable, creating a problem of the minority within a nation state, representing an internal threat. Various solutions were considered, including religious ones like conversion to Christianity and secular ones under a Marxist worldview, which <clears throat> insist on eliminating Jewish particularity with an emphasis on class struggle. The 19th century ultimately anticipates a colonial solution to the Jewish question by proposing uh, the settlement of Jews in Palestine as a solution to the inability of accommodating this minority within your European national territory. The solution that emerges for the Jewish question in Europe is the Zionist one, settlement of Jews outside the borders of Europe in a nation of their own. Mufti also argues that the Jewish question in Europe foreshadows the rendering of Muslims in the Indian subcontinent as unassimilable in the project of Indian uh, nation formation. Through his study of various writers uh, like uh, Foster, Kipling, and others, Mufti identifies a trend in these novels, uh, rendering the Muslim characters as unassimilable in the new nation in a manner very reminiscent of the Jewish question in the 19th century. These novels create the groundwork for the emerging discourse of the impossibility of accommodating Muslims within the decolonizing Indian nation, thus uh, setting into motion the eventual act of the Indian partition involving the creation of the new nation of Pakistan for Muslims and massive exchanges of populations across hastily created borders, resulting in unprecedented trauma and ethnic violence. Banerjee fuses the myth, uh, the Christian myth of the wandering Jew with the Hindu belief of reincarnation of souls in the Bardau's wondrous capers. Abra Vanel occupies a space distinct from British administrators and Bengali elites. It is indeed this trader, the wandering Jew, who is cast in the figure of the neutral historian of colonial Calcutta, recording the gossip and scandal of empire from both sides of the colonial divide in his journal. While Banerjee does not develop any background about the denial of full citizenship rights to European Jews with the advent of the modern nation state, the very presence of Abravanel in colonial Calcutta gestures at his uneasy relationship and lack of accommodation within Europe. Abravanel may be read as an early prefiguring of the cosmopolitan rather than nationalist masculinity. Moreover, Banerjee signals through Abravanel's recreation as digital data to a new kind of global nomad of the 21st century, the high-tech computer worker. The myth of the wandering Jew offers Banerjee another motif in his exploration of masculinity, the motif of travel and nomadism. This graphic novel set as it is in uh, London, Paris, and Calcutta, and a host of other minor locations, evoking through its drawings many cityscapes, constantly shifts the reader in time and place. The motif of travel is at one level connected to the European quest for trade and colonial expansion. It also includes the more recent uh, reverse migration from, ex from the ex-colony to the heart of the empire, undertaken by post-colonial subjects like Banerjee's narrator. By focusing on multiple uh, travelers, both uh, the colonial and the contemporary, in, in the contemporary era, this, uh, this graphic novel distinguishes its focus from the realm of domestic fiction. It is concerned with an expansion of male subjectivity through its encounter with new and emerging territories, rather than an introspective psychological development of subjectivity. This trope of travel is also explored through the wandering Jew who sidesteps the colonizer uh, colonized binary by eschewing any fixed national affiliation by embracing a diasporic ethnic minority subjectivity. Abra Vanel, who is a historian of the uh, underbelly of 18th century Calcutta, is reborn as digital Datta, who eschews physical travel by remaining fixed in his North Calcutta neighborhood, but is able to navigate many locations in cyberspace. However, this model of diasporic subjectivity, whether it is uh, 18th century, uh, whether it is the 18th century Jewish trader Abravanel or digital Datta is tenuous at best. Amir Mufti uh, points out throughout his study uh, to various 19th century British texts that in um, uh, I'm sorry, he points to the uh, to various 19th century British texts uh, about the inability to accommodate Jews into European nations, uh, which ultimately initiates the logic of colonial settlement of European Jews in Palestine. Similarly, the idea of a diasporic identity for digital data, which transcends national affiliations, 
also proves to be untenable. Although Datta can be a high-tech worker from India working for firms in the US, this is in fact touched on in, in uh, Banerjee's first novel, Corridor, where we first meet this character. Globalization has not allowed the free flow of labor across borders in sync with the flows of corporate capital. Gupta's uh, ability to contribute to the cyber economy is regulated by national immigration laws and the H-1B temporary visa uh, quotas issued by the U.S. and the American backlash against outsourcing of jobs to India and other countries. Digital Gupta is physically confined to his North Calcutta home and his neighborhood can, and can only travel in a virtual cyber community. The possibilities of travel and male subject formation for him have been considerably reduced in comparison with his predecessor, Abravenel. Both Abravenel and Datta remain unhoused in the economy of nation formation and haunting reminders for various groups of men who are marginal in global cities in the 21st century. The only sustained reference to a Muslim character in the Barnaul's Wondrous Capers is to the narrative and the life of the medieval Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta, who wrote a travelogue. This, the sto this story of Batuta's life is mentioned by Datta to the narrator of uh, Barnaul, Mr. Chatterjee, in one of the sequences of the graphic novel, which most effectively blends colored photography with black and white drawings and creates a striking image of North Calcutta neighborhoods. Even Batuta is presented by digital uh, is presented by digital Datta as quote the eternally dissatisfied Moroccan. Batuta and years at, an, at a young age traveled to Andalusia, Mecca, North Africa, and Asia before arriving to the court of Mohammed bin Tughlaq, the Sultan of Delhi, who was reputed to be insane. Batuta rose to prominence in Tughlaq's court and was sent to China as an ambassador. Even though he acquired wealth and married many wives, he continued to compare everything he encountered to what he had seen in Morocco and complained that the objects in Morocco were much better. Digital Datta's um, uh, quote, con a conclusion from this story is that the travel does not always open a traveler's mind. This is an interesting observation on cosmopolitanism offered by Datta, who in spite of being a high-tech worker is confined to his North Calcutta neighborhood and unlike the narrator Chatterjee, does not have the opportunity to travel. The story of Baduta may be Datta's own way of reconciling uh, to his fate, reflecting on an example of a traveler whose sensibility remained parochial in spite of having many opportunities to travel. The sequence of panels um, offers an interesting contrast between the narrative of Batuta's exotic travels as narrated by Digital Datta and the uh, setting for this narrative, the old lanes and buildings of North Calcutta where, where Datta lives. In addition, the sequence provides a remarkable juxtaposition of, of uh, Banerjee's dominant black and white ink drawings and digital photographs of buildings. So I'm gonna show you now this panel that I'm talking about. So I will have to uh, just give me a minute to share screen and go to application window. Uh, are you able to see the- Can I help you? No, no, no. Are you no, able no, to see Gautam? Not... Are you able to see Gautam? No, no, no. It's no? not visible here. No. Not visible? No. Uh, not visible. Let me go back to stream. Okay, now wait a minute. Oh, I'll try. Is it visible now? Uh, yes. Ha. Uh, yes. Okay. Kindly All do right. the full so, screen. Uh, can yeah. you can you see the picture of from the Barnaul's Wondrous Capers? Yes. 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 Please do okay. the full screen. You want me to do full screen? I. Yes. Yes. Let me see if I can uh, do full screen. I I don't think I can do full screen right now. Okay, okay. So let me just continue, okay? okay. And okay. I will move on to the other slides after this. So this, as I was talking about, you can see the juxtaposition of black and white drawing with uh, digital photographs of Calcutta in the background. Uh, and, um, it, and we see in this panel uh, a rickshaw puller uh, parting a passenger against the background of old Calcutta buildings with brick columns, arches, and verandas with wrought iron railings. 
the photograph is in color and the faded br uh, brown of the brickwork evokes the image of fading grandeur and decay, while a clothesline with hanging clothes suggests the continuing quotidian routines of urban life. I don't know if you can see the clothesline if the image is too small, but it is in the veranda. The photograph uh, and black and white drawing contrast the past and present of the city, almost like two different layers of the narrative of Ibn Battuta, uh, yet uh, another layer of the historical archive. Ibn Battuta's history is not, strictly speaking, uh, that of Cal specific to Calcutta. Instead, this is the history that resonates for all of India. I consider Ibn Battuta, the historical traveler's life, to have a close parallel with that of Abravanel and his reincarnation in digital data, even though the, the two latter mentioned characters are entirely fictional. This represents a parochial sensibility, even though even Batuta had had cosmopolitan experiences, Banerjee may be trying to cast Batuta as a false cosmopolitan, as opposed to Abravanel and, and the narrator of Barnaul Chatterjee, who embody a genuine cosmopolitanism. However, I read Batuta's presence in the graphic memoir as a medieval shadowy counterpart to the wandering Jew, Abravanel. Even Batuta's story is a reminder of the presence of 172 million Muslim residents contemporary India, whose fate is one of profound insecurity, and who, unlike Batuta, have no other homeland to return to physically or imaginatively. I will now segue into the more recent uh, uh, graphic narratives of um, Banerjee, and they include Harappa Files and Doab Bill. Although Sar Sarnath Banerjee's recent uh, graphic narratives have shifted to themes of climate change, his early interest in tropes of masculinity continues to surface in works produced after the Barnaul's wondrous capers. As his oeuvre expands, Banerjee's engagement with masculinity becomes more self-reflexive, and the works often provide meta-commentary and reflections on this trope. Banerjee's most recent work, Doab Dil, seems to abandon the classic attributes of a graphic narrative by relinquishing a sequential narrative in panels. Yet, even when he produces a book consisting of single page drawings, with no speaking characters, but captioned comments with each drawing, the uh, drawings and commentary are self-reflexive meditations on post-colonial masculinity. The shift from graphic uh, novels to a hybrid form of what Banerjee describes as pictorial stories begins in Banerjee's over with the creation of the Harappa Files in 2011. In the introduction to that book, Banerjee reflects that he had promised his editor never to write another graphic novel, but he returned to her office three years later with the manuscript of loosely bound graphic commentaries. In this latest pictorial book of graphic commentary, Doab Dil, Banerjee provides an introduction in which he maps his artistic journey. Doab Dil is the product of two simultaneous, uh, two simultaneous occurrences in Banerjee's career, his turn to reading nonfiction and being commissioned to create 90 murals for the new Deutsche Bank building in Canary Wharf, London. After consulting with his clients, he came up with the idea of making the whole building read like a book. Banerjee describes the Deutsche Bank project as a chance to archive my readings to put my thoughts into drawings, and in doing so, preserve books in my mind. Doab Dil collects many of the drawings from that art exhibit. Reflecting on the title, Banerjee writes, quote, that it brings together drawings and texts like two converging rivers, the fertile tract of land lying between two abundant, uh, two confluent rivers is called Doab, Persian Doab, two rivers. It is rich, drought-free, and populous tract where civilizations are born. These spaces between the text and the images form the central backbone of the book." Unquote. Banerjee also acknowledges in his introduction that the design and coloring were done by Shudip Chaudhuri, who helped him with the murals in the Canary Wharf exhibit and the process of reworking them into the book, Doabdil. Not having visited the murals and the Deutsche Bank uh, exhibit, I provide this background as a way situate the peculiar public-private nature of the, this particular book by Banerjee. Unlike Corridor and the Barnaul, Doab Dil has a very different relationship with its audience. In fact, the contents of the work must address two distinct audiences, the large crowd having access to the public exhibit in London and the uh, much more limited but globally dispersed audience who may be reading the text and images of Doab Dil in the privacy and seclusion of their homes. While uh, Doab Dil seems to be announcing any departures in audience genre and a shift from fictional characters to commentary 
of non-fictional books read by Banerjee. My own reading of the work focuses on continuities with his earlier preoccupation with masculinity rather than aesthetic ruptures. I argue that even with Harappa Files, when Banerjee turned to more non-linear commentary in graphic format, this focus on post-colonial masculinity that I explored earlier remains the abiding theme. In his most recent graphic na narrative, the preoccupation resurfaces, but the treatment of masculinity is imbued by a self-reflexive awareness of his own location of privilege, privilege within this discourse. Banerjee continues his exploration of uh, masculinity in Harappa files in which masculinity is once again expressed in the realm of conspicuous consumption. The same trope of conspicuous consumption uh, and the association of aggressive consumption with codes of colonial masculinity is replayed in the episode of the uh, of, um, of the sale of Jaguar to a man interested in, pro uh, in proving his elitist credentials. I'll turn now to that uh, image. So this is from uh, Harappa Files. I hope you can see image of Ratan Tata buying Jaguar. Is it visible? Hello? Yes, yes, visible. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, so, um, so in this, uh, the same same trope of conspicuous consumption can be seen. Banerjee juxtaposes uh, this with the purchase of Jaguar Company itself by Ratan Tata as an ostensible symbol of the inversion of colonial hierarchies. However, like in the Barnaul's Wondrous Capers, this work seems to be lamenting the diminished horizon of masculine self-formation in the post-colonial era, when anti-colonial resistance gives way to conspicuous and competitive consumerism as a limited mode of masculine self-formation. Banerjee is implicitly arguing that the Tata purchase of Jaguar is an expression of post-colonial masculinity at a macroeconomic level. However, the consequence of this kind of mimicry now are disastrous for the environment. Harappa Files documents the nightmarish traffic conditions in Delhi when cars move at a snail's slow speed and roads become transformed to vast parking lots. In this state of urban environmental crisis, the former masculine rivalries of colonial elites become grotesque monstrosities, and the potential reversal of colonial hierarchies seems an irrelevant anachronism in the face of larger environmental catastrophes, which preoccupy Banerjee's subsequent novel, uh, All Quiet in Picaspuri. The anxiety of post-colonial masculinity is explored in other images in Harappa files, which concentrate on ordinary citizens. Like Ratan Tata, these images depict scenes of intense academic competition among children. So I'm gonna uh, move now to that image. In one double page spread, we see the profile of a young student staring at billboards, depicting the mug shots of uh, IIT entrance exam rank holders interspersed by a mind boggling array of advertisements for various coaching classes. In the next page, the scene shifts to a family of three so uh, let me move to that. Uh, this is a family of three uh, parents flanking a teenage son, mother carrying a tender green coconut in her hands. In the commentary, Banerjee writes about the competition rate for IIT. The elimination is often 10,000 to one. Weeks before the end, and this is a quote from uh, Harappa Files, weeks before the entrance exams, uh, parents suffer sleepless nights. Hysteria and anxiety grip their souls. The high seriousness of this description is quickly debunked by Banerjee in the next comment, quote, in such a scenario, coconut water is strongly recommended. It is rich in source of nutrients for the brain and has the additional property of calming frayed nerves. In these sequences, masculinity and notions of male honor have devolved from fighting duels to being able to survive the battlefield of competitive exams. However, Banerjee reminds us in a subsequent full page image that the emphasis is not solely on academics as an area of competition. So let me move to that one. Uh, children have to prove themselves in co-curricular activities. This page uh, which also doubles as the cover of the book, Harappa Files, depicts an imposing mother in a red sari with two sons uh, holding onto her hands, walking down a city street. The city buildings form a silhouette in this picture. The boys are dressed in martial arts uniforms. In the commentary, Banerjee mentions that in Calcutta, children not only excel in academics, but they also have to excel in co-curricular activities. Girls are seen in the city practicing their scales, while boys join martial arts. Competitiveness and one-upmanship is thus a recurrent trope in colonial and post-colonial societies. However, the images of this 
uh, section in Harappa files um, reveal the diminished scope for the expression of postcolonial masculinity. The youth gazing uh, at the mind boggling array of coaching ads in, in previous slide and the young boys walking to martial arts with their mother express a loss of masculinity. The figure of the mother looks far more imposing than the sons who are diminutive by contrast whose dependence is suggested by their act of clinging to her hands. In this full page image and accompanying commentary, the uh, culture of competitive masculinity is evoked by reference to cultural academic competition and the culture of competitive sports and extracurricular activities. However, this trope of masculinity is already visually undermined by an overpowering image of the mother figure who seems to be wielding most of the power in the family. I do not consider the gigantic figure of the mother to be an expression of misogyny or fear of emasculation, but rather a satiric commentary on the discourse of masculinity itself, the relentless pressure to express power and dominance in post-colonial India, and the precarious nature of this attempt. So Abdil marks a shift from the culture of competitive masculinity and its parodic undercutting to the juxtaposition of colonial and post-colonial images of masculinity. Since this book emerges from Banerjee's reading of various non-fiction works, the images and commentaries reveal his preoccupation with some recurring tropes. The two opening sequences of Toab Dil focus on gardens and walking. In the opening image, we are offered a quotation from Sir Thomas Brown, which reads, whales, elephants, and camels, these I confess are the colossus and majestic pieces of nature, but in these narrow engines, there is more mathematics, and the civility of these little citizens more neatly sets forth the wisdom of their maker. So this is the image from uh, Do Abdil. This quotation for, uh, Thomas, uh, from Sir Thomas Brown appears in the midst of a two-page spread, which consists of a plethora of curiously shaped plants, birds, and insects, interspersed by, figures, by the figure of the male scientists and explorers. Among the various male figures which stands out, uh, one which stands out and is drawn in most detail is that of Sir Thomas Brown, uh, who lived from 1605 to 1682, who was a man interested in various branches of scientific learning as well as religion. The image continues the representation of intellectual achievement as a trope of masculinity. However, even in death, Sir Thomas Brown's words are recorded and passed down to us, reproduced here as a caption by Banerjee himself. In sharp contrast, in another image from the same book, that I will turn to, um, Indian soldiers who fought and died for the British Empire during the First World War have not been recognized for their courage. They have not left behind any oral testimonies or books like the Sir Thomas Brown. Banerjee comments that with the exception of Michael Onadshe's uh, character Kip, there is lack of representation of these uh, soldiers. Uh, their actions, which uh, certainly emblematize service, courage, and loyalty to the imperial might of Britain are not considered worthy of commemoration. In his reflections, Banerjee is acknowledging the privileges of race and location, which makes Sir Thomas Brown available as a model uh, of a pioneering scientist and a man of letters, while colonial subjects are denied a place of remembrance and mourning. Uh, in another image, uh, and this is the, the one, um, Banerjee reflects uh, that, uh, no, this is, I, I don't have a slide for this one. But in another image, Banerjee reflects that walking as a pursuit was not available to women since women could not, since women could be construed as prostitutes. Similarly, for colonial subjects, masculinity is defined by invisibility and oblivion. The unresolved contradictions of post-colonial masculinity are evoked in the haunting image of digital data, resurfacing as a ghost in Do Abdil. And that is, this is the image from Do Abdil. And we are familiar with uh, digital data because he has accompanied Banerjee in, from his first graphic novel, um, Corridor, then Barnowl's Wondrous Capers, and he reappears in the latest one. Um, Digital Datta reappears as a ghost in Do Abdil. Uh, he's drawn juxtaposed against the cityscape, haunted by insomnia. In his previous appearances, Datta had been haunted by the anxieties of his visa status. Here we see him embodying continuing anxieties about the status of postcolonial masculinity. In his transition from fiction to nonfiction and from narrative to commentary, Banerjee's preoccupation with masculinity has undergone a stylistic shift. Instead of an exuberant satirization of codes of colonial masculinity and their mimicry by postcolonial subjects presented in Barnall's Wondrous Capers, there is a transition to a quieter, introspective juxtaposition of varied visuals and commentary with gesture at his 
own awareness of his implicatedness within this discourse. Thank you. Let me uh, turn back. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks so a lot. Please. Let me stop sharing this so I can come back. Yes. Thanks a lot, Dee, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And, and first of all, all the systems are going on in such a smooth way that I forgot to mute my microphone while talking with Sirubadi. Extremely sorry for that. No, it's OK. Systems it was, like it was this, just a little bit. Uh, systems like this often make, make you dumb and numb also. Uh, so that <laughs> it's something like that. We have a few questions yes let me tell you mm, first one is that uh, this might be a slight digression from the area that you have chosen to explore but uh, how do you think that have the ruptures uh, in this masculinist body politic ideal been portrayed by writers of children's literature in the 20th century it's a slight obit question <laughs> Uh, I actually am not a specialist in uh, children's literature, so uh, the rap in the ruptures in the I, I'm I would be interested in knowing more because I'm broadly interested in in masculinist uh, studies and uh, of course questions of uh, the the male body and and its connections to uh, notions of the nation. So um, you know, uh, the, the children's literature is not something that that I uh, study. Or I have read, uh, you know, really beyond my childhood. So this is, uh, I, I would be interested in exploring more if there are, uh, if uh, other people have noticed parallels between what I said or presented about Banerjee in in his graphic novels and other children's works. That would be an interesting uh, thing for me to follow because I want to do more work on on graphic novels and Banerjee himself because he's still uh, actively producing more work. So uh, it, I, it would be helpful uh, for more research for me, but I, I am not in a position to uh, make a comparative statement at this point. Okay. Um, another question is that, um, first of all, it's an insightful session on graphic narrative. And can you talk about the representation of trauma and memory in the visual verbal medium of graphic narrative? For example, in the graphic novel of Malik Sajjad and Vishwati Ghosh, in this context, yes, uh, I, I am very much drawn to uh, uh, Malik Sajad's, uh, you know, uh, representation of uh, uh, the realities in Kashmir, and def definitely, you know, uh, uh, there's a very, um, you know, distinct um, connection between uh, his depiction uh, of, um, um, you know, the the troubled. Uh, situation in Kashmir and his own kind of autobiographical uh, reflections on growing up in Kashmir during those traumatic times and becoming it's it's much more uh, I I would say for Malik Sajad it's much more of a of a Bildungsroman or a Kunstler roman it's autobiography autobiography mm -hmm. of an artist and uh, uh, Sarnath Banerjee is uh, not really exploring yet. He might do that in some other context. He's not exploring so much his own intellectual and artistic formation. I mean, that would be uh, the, the difference. Both of them are, are, uh, are dealing with masculinity and questions of national identity, national trauma, for sure. Vishadati Ghosh, unfortunately, you know, I have uh, read a lot of commentary on him, but that book, uh, his partition uh, collection, is not available in the US and I have not been able to acquire it. This is another problem with doing work on uh, graphic fiction. The, the uh, print runs of these books are so small that, uh, you know, I think it is, the book by Bishwajiti Ghosh is published by Yoda Press and it is just yeah. uh, not available in print. And I, it's, it's, I have not even been able to acquire it uh, or get, uh, look at it through interlibrary loans, which are quite good here. So um, uh, again, you know, that's a uh, lacuna in my own uh, scholarship. I'm very interested in in, in uh, Bishwajyoti Kosh. I know Kavita Daya has written about Bishwajyoti Kosh and has taught Bishwajyoti Kosh, but it is almost impossible to get the book to, uh, you know, uh, acquire a sufficient quantity of the book to teach that. 
I, I would be interested in teaching Vishwajiti Ghosh for uh, as an introduction to uh, 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 questions of in the Indian partition. So both of these authors are uh, that that were mentioned in the question are are very significant and and uh, definitely connect with Sanat Banerjee because they are all they're all engaged in the exploration of um, uh, male bodies and nationalism. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks for your take. There's another question that uh, doesn't the masculine anxiety arise from a from a position of double patriarchy to be not regarded as highly as the toxic masculinity of the color overload of the colonial overload as well as to be compared to the women uh, vis a vis effeminity? This is the first part of the question, and the second part is in this regard that does the narrative of the mixed marriage of the British men favoring a Local spouse and the settling in India fall this as outlined by uh, William Darlimple's White Mughal and Anarchy. So this is a kind of obvious question, mm -hmm. but uh, so I uh, I will ask you to repeat the first part of the question is about um, um, the the second part I think is more about the intermarriage British yes. uh, ha, colonialist the marrying part, ha. Yes, and the, the first, first part is about the, Sorry, Gautam, go on. Uh, that about that uh, from a position of double patriarchy, yes. to be not regarded as highly as the toxic masculinity of the colonial overlord, as well as to be compared to the women as a femininity. This is the first part. Yes. Uh, so there is yes the the toxic masculinity. Somehow uh, we are. Uh, it's much more of a contemporary term, is it not? Because we hear it more in the context of. Uh, you know, um, uh, various uh, situations in the present, like uh, the, yes, yes, uh, the yes. infamous Me Too movement has, uh, you know, brought up the issue of toxic masculinity. I, I would uh, separate or distinguish toxic masculinity and its contemporary resonance with colonial masculinity. Uh, and uh, yes, definitely there is a psychic burden and, and an overload because of, uh, you know, the the patriarchy as well as uh, the racial um, uh, you know, connotations of colonialism. Uh, about the, the second part uh, of you know, intermarriage between uh, uh, the British and uh, the white woman, yes, that is a trope even in, in uh, parts of uh, popular culture. For instance, the Assamese film, which has also been made into Bengali film about the tea garden estate, and I recently heard a very very good paper on it in a at, at a conference. Uh, uh, Chameli Mem Sahib, you think about that. It's a British, uh, you know, tea uh, uh, merchant who uh, marries uh, Chameli, who is a worker, uh, basically a tea picker from a uh, very, very poor socioeconomic strata and a prop, uh, you know, a Dalit woman. So we do have uh, those examples, but that is not the uh, example that we see so much in, in, uh, in Banerjee's uh, uh, novels, because those are uh, more about, um, uh, you know, he, he is uh, not exploring uh, a British colon colonizer uh, in getting involved with local women. Uh, if there is a, 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 in Barnell's Wondrous Capers uh, a romance and a duel, but it's it's all limited to the European uh, uh, strata of society. Doesn't you know? It doesn't involve the locals. And the romances that you see among the colonial elites, they also do not cross the racial boundary so much. Uh, it's not as if these uh, Bengali Babu elites are uh, uh, socializing or romancing any of the British, uh, you know, females. In fact, that is a whole other territory. If you look at so many of the, um, uh, you know, early 20th century novels, whether it is uh, yes, yes. Passage to India by E. M. Foster, uh, the very attempts of uh, a, an Indian man to have any kind of a uh, social relationship with uh, a woman, like you know, you think I'm thinking of uh, Dr. Aziz and Adela Quested in uh, Passage to India. It creates uh, tremendous social anxiety, uh, you know, related to the idea of the purity of uh, of racial lineage. So it, it quickly kind of devolves into uh, uh, accusation of rape and scandal for Aziz. 
so, um, you know, uh, and, and there are anxieties of British masculinity kind of entangled with that because somehow masculinity is connected with uh, the honor and, and the uh, purity of, of the females within that particular tribal clan group. Okay, okay. Great. Thanks for your take. There is another question. Hmm. So, saying that with particular reference to the image of that gigantic mother pushing her children to take part in co-curricular activities, I have a question that previously extra co-curricular activities were seen as a kind of refreshment from the hectic classroom schedules, but now that too has been transformed into a scheduled task. So, is mm -hmm. it something that Sh Sharanath Banerjee is harping? And in this post-colonial masculinity, are women losing their feminine sensibility and trying to be more manly? What is your take on it? Oh, this is an interesting question. Yes, I definitely think that the idea of leisure and, uh, you know, co-curricular activities as being something which uh, uh, at least, you know, gives a sense of freedom or release from the routinized tasks of the school has been completely transformed. And that is not true just for India. I think it is it is true in a globalized sense. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, you know, uh, where um, I, I am part of the, uh, the diasporic Indian American community, there is uh, an overemphasis on all these scheduled activities uh, that uh, the children are uh, participating in one after the other. Uh, they're often overscheduled. And it's not just limited to the immigrant community. It is true for all um, uh, you know, ethnic groups. But it is certainly a phenomenon of uh, middle and upper middle class groups more because uh, they have more um, you know, expectations, and it is all uh, geared towards college applications because it is not enough just to uh, uh, prove your um, academic work, so to speak. You have to also prove yourself as a kind of an um, all-rounder. Uh, I don't know to what extent that applies to uh, admissions in Indian colleges. You'll be able to uh, tell me more uh, uh, as of now. It seems to me from a distance that it is it's still concentrated on these top scores that all these very cutthroat examinations which are also highlighted in harappa files not so much you know external activities uh, at least not to the extent of uh, getting admission in college but in in uh, the us these co-curricular activities are uh, uh, important and required uh, you know, almost as much as the uh, scores in uh, ACT or SAT exams to secure admission okay. in a good college. So definitely, it is. It is. You know, uh, it, there is no longer the uh, binary, the di uh, the divide between leisure and work for students. Everything is towards. Uh, it, everything has become commodified. Leisure has become commodified, and leisure too has to uh, uh, result in an end product, whether it is you know a certificate in karate or whether it is you know uh, a musical uh, you know. Um, uh, competition that you win, everything is, you know, uh, uh, geared towards resume building. And uh, in India, I, 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 he hasn't really uh, highlighted, you know, why uh, this has become so critical, uh, but it, it may be because of uh, social expectations that, you know, that you're not uh, simply confined to uh, you, books. You also, and it's also perhaps connected to the idea of masculinity that uh, you know you you need a uh, a, a, a sense of physical uh, empowerment, and that therefore you know uh, an emphasis in martial arts or other sports to uh, not just be um, uh, an improvement of your uh, scholarly credentials, but also your physical body. Okay, thanks for your tip. The, uh, now, uh, it's purely my observation, and uh, mm -hmm. as I have done through Charnath Banerjee's uh, corridor, but I think that uh, there is some kind of tepid masculinity is there. It's a kind of, uh, he's depicting some kind of postmodern life where the masculinity, it is unaggressive at the same, same, same time, self-reliant and the progressive, and at the same time, uh, he watered down some, uh, so many characters in the a very uneasy way in the changing world. So they do believe that um, there is a kind of tepid masculinity that he has 
tried to convey through his first text for it i like your uh, term tepid masculinity yes and i i think it is connected to one of the slides that i was trying to show of anxious masculinity with reference to digital data uh it's it's like uh, you know there is uh, uh he is in a limbo he is you know waiting for yes. uh, uh you know uh, uh, the uh, chance to prove himself because he is waiting perhaps for, in corridor especially he was waiting for a visa uh, or you know some opportunity to prove himself and other characters too that come and go seem to be uh, a little bit uh, you know uh, lacking uh, opportunities to prove their uh, capabilities and it is uh, anxiety about uh, employment in a in a uh, world uh, of global capitalism with its fluctuations um, you know where um, um, traditional kind of uh, uh, routines of middle class life have been disrupted uh, you know there is uh, no uh, sense of a secure um you know job that will be yours forever everything is um, uh, subject to change subject to the uh, ups and downs of um, the market and uh, and and that affects and, and to a large extent masculinity uh, you know uh, or these male characters have been conditioned to thinking that their worth or their manliness is is tied to their ability to uh, 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 be breadwinners or uh, you know earn money for their families and and that itself is is not a sure shot thing anymore in this changing uh, economy and environment and and that leads to uh, this uh, sense of anxiety a sense that especially true right now with with uh, you know this uh, coronavirus pandemic and uh, the huge economic impacts that it has had everywhere and also you know the, the whole, as i was uh, rereading uh, and getting ready for this presentation i was reminded uh, you know of the news that you know a, uh, president trump has uh, decided is not going to issue or the administration will not issue any more h1b visas for this year and the country most affected by that is actually india so uh, digital data's anxiety and his you know the stupid masculinity is uh, not something that that was a phenomenon of the early 2000s it's still very much current there are many other characters like him who are still living through these situations pleasant the um, i'm also telling all the participants that i have just shared the link uh, of your paper that mapping post colonial yes. masculinity in shanath banerjee's the barnaul's wonders uh, papers that has been published by south asian review and i have Shared the link in the chat box also, so that the participants or the listeners can go through the paper. It's a wonderful paper. And I think uh, second of all, I have another observation that uh, regarding this that post-colonial uh, masculinities that um, to some extent that uh, I think it can uh, help us to understand both the homosexual and at the same time the heterosexual. Um, binaries and at the same time uh, how um, these are produced and and experienced not only in the first uh, world context but also um, to some kind of um, transnational and uh, this kind of masculinity i think are are produced and experienced in third world context uh, as well so the what is your take on it yes you're right to do yes your your you know this is where uh, very good question gautam that you are asking me about the binary of heterosexuality and homosexuality and yes homosexuality. this in in banerjee's uh, depictions he is firmly located masculinity in, within a heterosexual context so all uh, the romantic relationships that are de depicted are very firmly heterosexual uh and also not uh, not uh, heterosexual in the sense of the monogamous bourgeois marriage but uh, you know the uh, the extramarital uh, the uh, non monogamous tropes are, are what he is exploring but surely you know there are many other aspects of uh, masculinity and this whole idea of effeminacy is is connected to uh, you know uh, the idea of non normative sexualities and uh, there hasn't been much so among as when i began i was trying to uh, you know uh, explore uh, you know uh, uh, what work has been done in masculinity studies for south asia and for postcolonial studies in general and uh, in the critics that i looked at whether it is uh, 
uh, you know, uh, Ashish Nandi or uh, yes. Canon, you know, much earlier, they're all still located within a heterosexual paradigm. So nobody yet, I mean, our, I haven't yet uh, found, uh, and I need to do more research on uh, explorations of um, uh, homosexuality within the colonial and uh, post-colonial context. And um, and certainly that is that is a rich area of exploration. I think masculinity studies itself has not been looked at enough. Uh, there is, uh, but that is there is work to do, and uh, I hope I can continue with these explorations, not just limited to uh, graphic novels, but but of uh, you know other you know uh, areas, other uh, cultural production, whether it is uh, uh, fiction or poetry, uh, to explore other depictions of masculinity. And certainly, I am interested in. In looking at uh, uh, you know homosexuality as uh, a constituent of um, this discourse, we at the same time also uh, we can also uh, engage it or we can also connect it with the affinities uh, of queer theory also to to some extent. I'm sorry, Gautam, say that this again. Post uh, the, this post-colonial masculinity can be associated with the affinities uh, of, um, of queer theory also. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course. Queer theory has to be, you know, uh, uh, brought into a produ productive uh, uh, dialogue with, uh, you know, post-colonial studies. So a nation, again, the nation, you know, as studies of the nation have focused more or less on uh, this um, uh, heterosexual imaginary and also uh, the figure of the woman has been seen as a represent allegorical representation of of uh, the nation and uh, th but there are you know many ways in which male bodies are implicated in nation formation and nationalist discourses and uh, uh, queer theory particularly uh, you know uh, uh, authors like judith butler uh, have done so much work on on performance yes, of yes, gender butler. Performance of gender, and and especially when you, know, you think of a crisis, like a, another area that I work on is 9/11 studies, and there, you know, South Asian and Arab American masculinity has been problematized. Mm -hmm. You know, has been seen as this figure of, uh, you know, the um, the terrorist, you know, the turbaned Sikh, uh, has been collapsed with the um, Taliban or uh, the Al Qaeda, and they have been seen as sources of threat. Uh, Jasbir Puar has done, you know, some uh, great work on this. You know, like seeing the uh, the terrorist, uh, especially the Muslim uh, extremist terrorist, also as a kind of a, a queer uh, homosexual character. That's wonderful, and the um, I'm totally agreeing with the fact that yes, for the butler, this uh, some kind of incongruities or the all the. Dissonances are surrounding that cultural circulation and the reception of some kind of representation of post-colonial masculinity. Sometimes um, they can uh, contested and at the same time they can be resisted uh, with the dominant culture of of all kind of discourse. Also, it's a wonderful lecture, dear, and nice to have you with us. Thank you. And Thank you, Gautam. At the same time, you have. I would like to personally thank you for for your presentation. And judging from the comments of those who attended it, it seems that this last session seemed to be extremely successful. And most of the credit goes to you and the others who gave such interesting presentations. Yes, Both I there, was able. I'm sorry. Uh, I was able to hear Roshni Sam Gupta's. It was such an interesting presentation. Yes. Yes, and we hope that. Uh, you will want to be involved in our further academic ventures and we are pleased, pleased to have uh, your participation in this lecture series and we thank you for your valuable contribution. At the same time, it's a fact that your presentation uh, 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 on Sarnath Banerjee kept our lecture series, uh, uh, all the attendants um, to some extent spellbound, motivated and uh, longing to read graphic narratives. And uh, I'm receiving chats in my WhatsApp that people are telling that uh, this one of the areas uh, on which they want to read and explore more. And many of us realized how much we enjoyed being part of this genre. And a few of us, even I think, uh, began planning to read Indian graphic narratives at first. It's a 
very nice meeting here with Udi and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Gautam. And uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, what is the presentation in the last, the last presentation in the nine in the uh, eight p.m. section? Uh, tomorrow, ha, ha, ha. tomorrow we have three presentations. Uh, first, uh, it will be delivered by Team Lancedor, and uh, he will speak on prejudice and zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, genre and the question of literature today. The second presentation will be delivered by Orko Chattopadhyay, and he will speak on. Mathematics, Psychoanalysis, and Modernist Literature, and the third one by Sanjita Ghos, is the uh, artistic director of SOAS, South Asian Institute UK, mm -hmm. and she will speak on reincarnations of Bengal feminine literature and mm. memory. So, oh, very interesting. I hope to at least catch the third one uh, based yes, on my yes, time. And I want you to catch all the three sessions, if possible for you. And I'm requesting all the participants to be with us uh, for the next three sessions that will start from 6 p.m. tomorrow. Till then, stay safe. And good night. And Thank they, you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Your session was mesmerizing. Oh, thank <laughs> we were and, uh, is it possible? So this is available on YouTube uh, after this? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 It will be there. Yeah, okay, so there. I, I can ask people yeah. to look. And the comments are on uh, the comments that you were referring to, are they on YouTube or have they sent you on WhatsApp? Um, they are on YouTube. Many of them are on YouTube. Okay. okay. Many of All them right. are YouTube. Huh? All the comments okay. are also in the uh, YouTube also there. And I uh, and I will share the link. Okay. So that Thank you, you can also share with it. That's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Next time I will learn how to share full screen because I, <laughs> I don't know how what it looks like. You have, you, you, you have you to press have F5. To press F5 for it. F5. F5 for it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. But was it at all visible or but like uh, or, or not at all? It was. It was visible. No, it was uh, and and presentation like it doesn't need full screen also. <laughs> But telling in such a way that it was visual and verbal. It seems <laughs> that a graphic narrative uh, we are going through. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Anyway, okay, F five. I I should have asked you that before, but I I was uh, didn't want to mess with it while in the middle. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sri Rupa and Gautam. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Okay. bye all the participants. This, yeah. Uh, with this, uh, we come to the end have. of the second day uh, of this lecture session. We'll be hoping to see all of you uh, tomorrow, same time. Okay. Good night till then.